Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. Welcome to Wine and On. My name is Matthew Bowden, the Encouragable Rogue, and today I am with Brian Hulse. Brian, good evening. Please good evening. tell everyone a little bit about yourself. Good morning for you, Hello. indeed, in the lovely Japanese morning. Yes. My name is Brian Hulse, originally from the United States. Started street performing in 1986, and since 1990, for the past 30 years, I've lived in Japan and performed almost exclusively in Japan, from performing as a juggling unicycle comedy variety entertainer. I also do event production, TV production, a lot of production coordination work for non-Japanese speaking crews that come to Japan who need production support. I've taught English as a second language to get through the meager winters after the Kobe and Fukushima earthquake disasters, which put the Japanese economy on its ear. Love teaching so much. I went back to university and got a master's degree in education. Wow. And what did you teach? Uh, English is a second language, mostly business English and okay. presentations, communication skills. I'm a communication skills coach for international business people. Okay, cool. And so um, just sharing the last things here before we get into the true, but I feel like we naturally reached that point. Why, why begin this journey? Why start like this? You know, why create this every life day, of being an entertainer? Every day when I wake up, I stare at the ceiling and think the same thing. How did I get here? <laughs> Should I have turned left instead of right at the meager age of, and where does it go back? Maybe eight, eight years old. I realized I liked performing and it was a hobby that turned into a summer job at 17 and it's been the endless summer. So when you say you began and you enjoyed it, do you want to go through that in a bit more detail? I grew up in a small farming community in central Indiana, 2,000 people, 10,000 cows, surrounded by cornfields and agriculture. Lived a mile out of town, so it was close enough to get to by bicycle, but not close enough to have tons of friends to hang out with every day. I lived there from the time I was in kindergarten, same house until I was 18 and one of my little walkabout that's lasted 30 years. My earliest performance experience, uh, memory I can have is doing puppet shows. Okay. So basically I was this country boy playing with dolls in his bedroom alone. So you were, you were doing puppet shows on your own? You were just playing? I was doing puppet shows on my own. Yeah. And my mother had these 45 albums with stories on them from her childhood. Three Billy Goats Gruff, Midsummer's Night Dream. Um, those are the two major productions I can remember. Uh, Aladdin, uh, several classic stories that were on a, a two record set. And on the inside of the album cover, it had the script of what the narrator and the actors were saying. So I don't know what prompted the idea, but I thought, hey, if I had a cast of characters, I could produce my own show using this soundtrack and syncing my puppets to the soundtrack. Oh, if I had a theater, I could invite the neighbors and my mother's friends' kids and they could come over. So I made a curtain that would go up and down and I used the couch and turned it on its side. And I had a theater. And I used a Baby Ruth beach towel as the curtain. So it looked like I had corporate sponsorship, even though so Baby even, Ruth of course, had nothing to do with the production. So even back then, you were thinking of angles for funding? I guess, subliminally, maybe. And I did charge admission. One penny for, I, one cent for kids and five cents for parents or something. And did the like, show go and, well? Did people enjoy it? Oh, yeah. I, I, it, it, there were two productions, Midsummer's Night Dream and Three Billy Goats Gruff. And, um, yeah, in my memory, they were perfect. <laughs> they were epic. Well, and but was I'm this sure indicative were, of a... I'm sure they were, they were very painful 
to watch. I'm sure everyone was very polite about it after. <laughs> was it indicative of a broader trend of you as a young person being into theatre and being into story creation and performance? I don't... I, I, I cannot remember a time in my life that I wasn't either involved in a production or pretending that I was involved in a production. And so how did it evolve? I have, I have no... Oh, how did it evolve? Um, yeah. So I did puppets, and then I was fascinated with acrobatics and uh, gymnastics. So I wanted to be a gymnast and a diver. So we had an in-ground pool. 1976, my father installed a pool, and I would climb up on the pool house and do the one meter over the concrete leap of death into the pool, which my mother hated and my father thought was kind of cool. And I, to get onto the pool house, I would have to scale it like a, you know, like a Spider-Man. And um, so I spent a lot of time in the pool and was there something about that that was a kind of adrenaline seeking? You were trying to test yourself, trying to feel Maybe. feel alive, it, like this jeopardy. There was no there was no cognitive process that I can remember. It was just let's do this, let's. And I had my neighbors had a huge wooded hilly pasture area between my house and their house, which the area was known as over the fence. I'm going to go over the fence. I'm going to go play over the fence. And I would spend hours in the woods. Um, I remember in the creek, there was an uprooted tree with an incredible root system sticking up. And it had been there for quite a while. And I remember pretending it was a pirate ship and playing in the creek for hours, uh, recreating pirate uh, adventures. And this was this is very young, seven, eight years old. And so was this was this using theatre to fill empty spaces in your life, maybe? I well, it was. My neighbors were across the street. There were three girls, um, farm girls, who were up at, you know, their father had hundreds of cows, and so they were the hardcore farm family across the street, and they were the. Older, old, two older girls and a younger girl. So we didn't really, I thought we were buds. <laughs> but after growing up and meeting them again, Linda, the one that I thought I was, you know, chums with, she was like, You were such an obnoxious little kid. I hated you. <laughs> I was like, Babysitting me? You didn't babysit me. We hung out. And she's like, Nah, I was getting paid. It's like, Oh. Okay, so that's how it is. Oh, but no, so no, no. Start... I mean, very. That's very tiny part of my childhood. The other neighbor down the hill, his grandfather had started the insurance agency in town. His father was running it when we were young, and since then, my friend Chad, he has moved on to be the local insurance guy. And they had this really cool house down in the valley, in the woods, an old cabin that Dad had bought and renovated, and still there today it's one of my favorite places in the world so chad and i were always hanging out and chad was younger than i was so i was kind of like the leader and i got to go to summer camp one year and chad was too young to go so i remember coming back from summer camp and thinking oh chad didn't go to summer camp so i've got to do summer camp for chad so i created this whole week-long program to recreate in my mind i was recreating the camp experience that Chad didn't get to do because he was still too young. He was like maybe five or something, six. And we did a rock painting. And I still, my mother's house, I still have one of the rocks that Chad and I painted. And I think there's, there's memorabilia in Chad's house of our childhood as well, like all the stuff. My father built their cabinets in the kitchen. So it's very nice, pleasant childhood memories. Um, but I just didn't have a lot of other friends in the neighborhood to play with. So I think that's one of the reasons that I started, you know, doing these imaginary adventures and playing and with did, puppets. Did it bleed into your schooling? Puppet, did you do theater in school? I did some 
civic theater training in junior high, I guess. My parents realized that I was interested in this kind of stuff. So we were an hour away from the largest city, Indianapolis. And the Indianapolis Junior Civic Theater had workshops for teens. So I would go, I remember doing two seasons of theater workshops there. And then in, so this is junior high and on, I was involved in theater productions, but between oh. junior high and eight, that's the key. And eight what's our year, old, what's old, year we are at the moment? Where, where in time? I was born in 68. You? So in 78, I was 10. So we're looking at like so 82. 76. The summer of 76 oh, was epic. Okay. Oh, you're the right, summer yes. of 76, that was the year we got the pool. That's the year I started to becoming the high diver, acrobat. Look, I can do a backflip off the 10 foot tall roof and For one of my birthdays or Christmas, I got the 101 magic trick box or the maybe the 21 magic tricks that you can do at home. I was very like the, the plastic cups in, and stuff. Yeah. And I, I remember when I was a little kid to go out, I, I got interested in magic. So my mom bought me a little magic book and thumb tip. And I had no idea. I, I remember thinking thumb tip that I read the book, 101 things to do with the thumb tip. And I was too young to understand it, and I'd never seen anybody work with one. My mom found a magic shop somewhere in Indianapolis, the empty sleeve. And it was just some guy's apartment, and he had a bunch of magic stuff in there. He's probably a pedophile. Um, and that's how he used magic to lure kids into his den. Um, I never went there, so my mom came back with a lot of the boy. Yeah. And, but uh, so, oh, and I must apologize right now. I didn't mean to offend magicians who sell stuff out of their apartment. I, you know, I, I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want to be labeled as, you know, non-PC. Not every magician who sells stuff out of his house is a pedophile. Only most of them. Thank you for, thank you for clearing that up. At least in the United so States, in the Midwest. Where I, you know, my culture, because I, you know, where, where I'm you a very magic. globally minded person now, and I know there's a lot of yeah. fucking douchebags in the world that, you know, oh, good man, you said something to me. Look at the comments now. They're probably lighting up. I better lay off I, of this. I think the site, I think the safe environment. I think we're still doing the, aren't we just in the introduction stage? We're, we're in still introduction talking about going from puppets to street yeah. performing, right? Yeah. Mm. I mean, we're at the, your, your youngest period, which is logically the time you mentioned pedophilia, of course, you know. Uh, I, thought it would be funny. <laughs> I thought it'd be funny. I'm from the funny. Midwest, and I started performing in the 80s. And then I came to Japan, so I'm totally, it's like I'm in a time warp. If I try to say stuff funny in English, I offend people. It's, I'm trapped. That's why I'm here. I well, can't we, can get, we can get into that more in a while. We've got a long way okay. to get into your... Into your yes, yes. You know, so, there I was, eight company. years old. Then I get yeah. the magic stuff, and I look at it, <laughs> and I'm like, I can't think of any... I, I, don't, uh, I don't get this thumb tip thing. Nobody's going to believe this. This is stupid. Nah, it doesn't work. So, the, the blow the balloon up in the tube and stick the pencil through it, I could understand that, and... Uh, the flip the box over, it's empty, and then you flip it over the other way, and all of a sudden you can pull all this stuff out of it. I could see that. And they'll go to the public library and find that there were a couple books in the, the bottom shelf in the back, how to make your magic illusion. And so I'd use some cardboard boxes, and then I'd make magic show. So I would, And so you were into this then? This wasn't just a give you this and you oh, just sit no. and it for an hour. And you I were remember dedicated. when we, uh, I remember going, my mother had this uh, suitcase. This, this is like, see this uh, suitcase there? Wow, yeah, I see it. That's my first road case. Is and that you? That's me and my oh, father. look at you. In my, uh, in my closet. I had a huge closet. 
That is a huge closet. I, I grew up in the closet. I was in the closet. I moved my bedroom into the closet so I could use my bedroom as a studio. So I was always creating something. According to my mother, I was always doing something, making plasticine uh, characters and, and making animated films, stop motion film. That was later. But this, uh, the reason I show this road case picture, this is hilarious. Because there was a book. I had a book of, you know, magic tricks you can do with stuff at home. And my mother was from New Jersey. So every summer we'd fly out to New Jersey or take the train or drive to visit grandma for a couple of weeks. And we were flying out. Mom, my sister and I were going to fly out. And then dad was going to come out later. And I'm like, okay, I got my luggage together. And I had this road, I had this red case. I'm ready to go. And it had a label on it. It still has the label. It was Brian the Great, written in um, Magic Marker. I put ma masking tape on the case in the middle and wrote Brian the Great and little squirrely things around the outside. And my mother said, what is this? This is my magic show. I'm going to show grandma my magic show when we get to New Jersey. She said, so what do you have in it? She says, well, you know, the stuff I need to do my magic show. So it's got this big box. It's just, at the time, it was this, you know, it came up to like my chest. I was that small. It was as big as I was. But I, I said, I want to walk, I want people in the airport to see me and go, oh, look, it's the magician. I have a vivid memory of saying that to my mother. And she said, well, what do you have in here? Let's look. And I had a plate, a glass, a knife, a bar of soap, and a quarter, two quarters. So you put bar of soap, you rub on the back of the plate, and you stick a quarter to it. And then you put the, you don't show anybody the back of the plate. You say, okay, magic trick. And you, you put the plate on top of the glass, and then you put the quarter on top of the plate and then you put a napkin over it and then you steal the quarter out and when you tap on it the quarter on the bottom of the plate falls into the glass it magically looks like the quarter has passed through the plate big magic trick which my mother said well grandma has all of these things at her house so we can just use hers to show her the magic trick and I'm like yeah but I want to walk through the airport with my road case and she looked at me like, where did you come up with this? It was bizarre. We didn't take the case to New Jersey. And I don't even know if I did the magic trick for grandma or not. But one of my earliest childhood memories, about eight, nine, maybe yeah, seven, eight, nine, was wanting to be recognized as the performer. Where that came from, I have no idea. Maybe like culture, lots of things. And so what happened after this then? How did it progress? Did so you get magic, to do shows? I thought, well, magic is, um, you got to practice a lot. And so I kind of got away from it puppets and like I'm hidden behind the couch and so and then you know I started playing in the pool and doing acrobats acrobatics off the roof and then I totally got into that and then in 19 I was 12 so I guess it was 1980 my father sold his business and he said we're going on a road trip he bought a Volkswagen van and we spent six weeks traveling from Indiana to the West Coast of the United States, up through Canada, up into Canada, Rockies, down the West Coast to San Francisco, and then back through Las Vegas and back to Indiana. And on this trip, we were waiting for a ferry to cross a body of water in Oregon or Washington State. And my mother comes back to the camper and says, Brian, you've got to come and meet this guy, Jack. Jack the juggler. Let me introduce you. And there was this hippie juggler dude on his way to a festival with a backpack 
and a hand a homemade devil stick dowel rod with two plastic lemons on the end screwed into it and he was doing some juggling and, and I was mesmerized. I don't think I'd ever seen juggling in person and started hanging out with this bearded hippie dude. Hung out with him the entire time while we we're waiting for the ferry and then talking to him on the trip. And by the end of the ferry ride, we come down the gangplank with me standing on his shoulders. And I've got a photo of me somewhere with me standing on Jack's shoulders doing the two man high at the age of 12. So the next day we're at, in a campground and I'm like, I'm gonna learn to juggle. What do I have to work with? And in the glove box, I found some balloons from someone's political campaign, uninflated balloons. And they said, you know, Bob for city council or something. I filled them with dirt with a funnel and tied them off and started learning to juggle. And by the time we got to Las Vegas, I could juggle. And we stayed at Circus Circus, probably because my parents knew I was interested in circus. And it was the friend, family friendly place to go in Vegas. What is Circus Circus? Circus Circus is a casino, a circus themed casino in Las Vegas. And it was the first kind of family friendly destination for Las Vegas. Okay. And it's still there, but the original it's, you know, of course it's, it's old school Vegas. And it would be interesting to go back and check it out and see what it's like. I had been there once maybe 15 years ago and it had gotten much bigger and more glamorous. But in 1980, they had a magic shop there. And in the magic shop, there was a juggling book, The Joy of Juggling, written by David Finnegan. And in the back, it said, if you want to know more about juggling, join the International Jugglers Association. Here's the address. So I wrote a letter, said I would like to join the International Jugglers Association. And I became a member and started getting this semi um, maybe bi-monthly newsletter that was it wasn't even photo it was printed out black and white um staple bound maybe six to twelve pages long and that was that was so exciting to read these stories and then they have a list of all the other juggling associations regional juggling associations throughout the country nothing in indiana um at that time, but when we would go to New York, upstate New York to visit my father's, my paternal grandparents, or New Jersey to visit my maternal grandparents, there were juggling clubs that would have weekly meetings or classes. So in the summer, my parents would drive me to these, you know, like I wanna to go to the Rochester Institute of Technology on Thursday night, there's a two hour juggling class run by a guy named uh, Greg Moss. Turned out Greg Moss was the championships director for the IJA at the time, the International Jugglers Association, which at that time was just the United States, which shows how pretentious United States people are back in the 70s, maybe still today. But um, I met Greg, my parents met Greg. They left me there at a, a RIT and hung out with these college kids, juggling for a couple hours. And then afterwards he said, why don't you come are you coming to the Cleveland convention this year? And Cleveland, Ohio is four hour drive from my parents' house. And Greg spoke with my mother and said, if you bring him, I'm taking another boy that's Brian's age and I'm gonna be looking after him at the Cleveland convention. Um, if you bring Brian to Cleveland, I'll take care of him. I'll keep an eye on him for the week. So my mother said, sure, let's go. So this was, I was 12 or 13. And my parents drove me four hours up to Cleveland, Ohio and dropped me off at this gymnasium filled with 600 jugglers. And after we met Greg and got me signed up and everything, and I walked into the public practice space, the first people, the first people I see are Arsene and Waldo. Arsene and Waldo are iconic 
street performing jugglers from the late 70s, 80s. Waldo from the Waldo Woodhead Show and Arsene. Arsene's from France. And they were passing clubs. And they would, as they were practicing, they'd get a huge crowd of other jugglers to watching in the gym. And I just remember watching and thinking, this is amazing. I'd never seen people pass before and never seen people manipulate hats. And Waldo's just so funny. Waldo's hilarious. And that kind of started my juggling. I was kind of like, whoa, I can, juggling's cool. And I started being very interested in the, the comedy aspects of juggling. And unlike magic, if you make a mistake, you can recover from it eloquently and people are not phased by it if you play it right. And unlike puppets, you have interaction with the audience instead of the audience having interaction with the puppet. So, and then I met a girl. There was a family from Quebec. Joanne was there with her father, Francois, her brother, her sister, and her parents. And the father, their father was a juggler, and the kids became jugglers by default. And I remember thinking, and she only spoke French. And I remember thinking, when I get in high school, I'm going to study French, and I'm going to go to Montreal, and I'm going to meet Joanne. We're going to go out on a date. Oh. And I was still like, you know, 12, 13 years old. A few years later, I study French, write her a letter, go to visit. By the time I finally meet up with her years later, um, we never actually got to go on a date. But that, that will come later. That story is when I'm 18 so, or 19 on my so way what to happens, uh, What happens next after stuff. the convention then? So you've done the convention, you've met all these jugglers, you thought it's incredible. You wanted yeah. to understand then, uh, the comedy of juggling more. And that's not just yeah. in the workshop. It sounds like you're the sort of person that would go home and research and stuff. Yeah, well, as research it as much as you can in Indiana in mid 80s, no internet, of course. I get one magazine every two months, some photos in it. So, how uh, did you research? Oh, them? so Michael Davis on Saturday Night Live. I was a huge fan of Saturday Night Live, childhood dream, be a cast member on Saturday Night Live. Loved. I did really, didn't really understand a lot of it in retrospect, but for some reason, John Belushi, Dan Aykroyd, Robin Williams. Oh, on that, I was a huge, huge fan of Steve Martin. And his album, the great fucking Dini. Oh, the the, I'm a wild and crazy guy. I had it on cassette tape, and it was on that trip, the six week trip out west, that I listened, listened to that over and over and over again. Loved it, and I remember my sister telling me that he had come out with a new album called Wild and Crazy. I'm a wild and crazy cow. I'm like, really? Oh, I've got to get it. She had me so wound up. And I was running around. Every time we get to a town, I'd be like, do you have a wild and crazy cow? And people would look at me. And finally found out that she was just pulling my leg. And, um, yeah, so from a young age, I was very enthralled with comedy. And then Eddie Murphy on Saturday Night Live. Oh, I loved, I lived for Saturday Night Live to see these hilarious um, sketches. So when do you do your first show that's not for your family? 13. But is this, so this is after Birthday the convention? Party. After the convention, later it was in the winter. Um, one of my friends, my father's, business associates in Indianapolis. My father and I started kayaking when I was eight 
and we'd go in the winters, we would go to the uh, kayak practice sessions in indoor pool in Indianapolis. The kayakery. Yes. So you learn how to flip over and roll back up so you can right yourself. And so we'd drive on the weekends, we would go to Indianapolis and one of dad's business associations, younger son. I remember I was 13 and the kids were eight. So here I'm going and entertaining these eight year old kids as a clown, magic clown. And uh, I remember doing the first one and thinking, oh, I don't want to do birthday parties for kids. It's too much work. I remember getting 35 bucks. And a few weeks later, one of the mothers of one of the other kids at the first birthday party wanted me to come and do her child's birthday party at the child's request. And I thought, I really don't want to do it. Maybe I'll raise my price. So I thought it was $65. And she said, okay. And I thought, whoa, that was easy. And this is your 13 now. So this is like 1978, yeah. 1979? 1978, 1979. $65 is quite a lot of money for like a half an Tell hour. Tell me about it. Especially yeah. when you're 13. living in the cornfield. Minimum wage at that time was like $2.75 or something. Yeah. So, and I remember one of my, my uh, neighbors, the insurance guy, said, uh, my office's driveway has got all these rocks on it. need it swept. I'll give you 50 cents to sweep my 50 cents a week or 50 cents to come and sweep my thing once a week. I did the first time I did it, I took that 50 cents around the corner to the ice cream store and it was gone and one ice cream. And I remember thinking, this isn't, I'm not, I, I don't want to do this. I don't want to sweep rocks for 50 cents an hour. Mm, there's got to be a better way to make money than this. And clearly after the second birthday party, you thought I've discovered it, surely. And it wasn't really, a. I mean, that the money thing wasn't, it wasn't like I was jonesing for money because I didn't have any place to spend it anyway. Um, and I really didn't want any, everything I wanted, I kind of had, you know, I had a bicycle, I had, I wanted a motorcycle and my father's like, no, we're, you're going to tear up my yard. You're going to hurt yourself. No need to be ranting and raring around on a motorcycle. You get hurt. If you want he one, buy it wrong. yourself. Yeah. If you want one, buy it yourself. I'm like, oh, okay, I guess I don't need a motorcycle. So I had friends that had them. So I could go and over to their house. And, so uh, how did the, 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 how did the show? The, street, the girls across the street, they had an old Yamaha. Yeah, but they were um, being paid to hang out with you. But I do have fond memories of riding around on the back. I never got to drive it because I was too little. But running around, it was like, oh, I want a motorcycle like they have across the street. And they're like, yeah, but we don't have a big cow patty to run it in. And you can't go over there and run your motorcycle in their cow patty. So if you want to ride on a motorcycle, you can go across the girl, play with the girls across the street. And then one of my childhood friends, Ronnie and Steve Walker, they had motorcycles. Whenever I go over to their place, we'd ride motorcycles. Whenever they'd come over to my place, we'd play circus. And I remember Ronnie saying, Brian, why is it every time we come to your house, we got to play circus? I'm like, I don't know. Why is it every time we go to your house, we got to ride motorcycles? And... Yeah, so it was. So, how did the shows progress? So, you've done these two birthday parties at this point now. How does it mm. move on from there? So then, well, early on, this juggling thing became a huge hit amongst my friends in like fifth and sixth grade. We actually became it became so crazy. Everybody wanted to juggle that the teachers were like, "No juggling during indoor recess." Because everybody was, you know, there were yahoos throwing stuff. And were you, were you the spreader of this? Or was this culture? Not necessarily the, time? the spreader. The wave? 
But I was trying to practice juggling off in the corner and everybody else was like, oh, I want to juggle. And another one of my friends knew how to juggle or he kind of learned. And then everybody, so many people learned to juggle when we were 12 or 13. And it was a big hit. And that was about fifth grade, sixth grade. And only two of my friends really kept up with it. And we did some shows together, like at a some kind of civic, you know, Lions Club Christmas party or the church bazaar. And then so you did it a, for fun, or you did it? Yeah, we did it for fun. Mates, we would do it for fun, or you know, wherever somebody would enter, you know, ask us to come to a show, we'd go and do a show. And one of the neighboring schools. One of the teachers at a neighboring school, Daryl Hood, he had a magic show and an old magic hat, and we'd get a show. I'd get booked to do a show, and we'd borrow some, you know, stuff from Daryl. And Daryl was always very encouraging. Daryl's the one that told my mother about the empty sleeve in Indianapolis, so you know where you can buy some magic stuff. Yeah. And um, so it seems like you had a very close knit community. It was quite supportive yes, I, I, as you it, were it, growing. It, it, if anybody's familiar with American TV from the 50s, it was like Leave it to Beaver, Happy Days, My Little Town, Three Stoplights, 2,000 People, the founding fam, you know, the guy who made up the the slogan that's on the Nightstown, a nice place to visit, a better place to live, written by Thomas Mayhill, who had Mayhill Publishing, who published a little Nightstown banner newspaper and the Farm Week magazine. And, you know, the May Hills were the publishing family and the Lakeys were the insurance family, third generation. There may be five or six huge farm families that own thousands of acres. And they're, you know, they probably, their grandparents probably went there in 1850 and ran the Indians off, cut down the trees, killed all the buffalo. But that kind of, you know, I'm an American Midwestern boy. Yeah. My father was a farmer. Uh, he grew up on a farm in upstate New York, a vineyard. Oh, wow. And they had one dairy cow to provide milk for the house. And my father was assigned the task from the age of like eight to go out and milk the cow every morning. So he'd have to get up at five o'clock in the morning and go milk the cow for breakfast milk. And upstate New York would get horrendous snows in the winter, so sometimes he'd have to traipse through snow taller than himself to get to a cow that was twice his size, milk the cow, carry the milk back in, and have breakfast, and then commute to school some ungodly, you know, an hour each way uphill and with a goat on his head, walking backwards, no shoes, that kind of upbringing. And then pounding, my father grew up pounding vineyard toast with grandpa. So he was a he, tough guy. He was a tough guy. And he, he learned how to hunt. He would hunt squirrels with a, a handgun. Um I guess he was quite a good shot. He must have been he also had a, a little he had a twenty two rifle. But Brian, and the thing would you, you go they would you know they would um so my father came from very humble beginnings and moved yeah. to Indiana as a forester. So he was involved with agricultural people, buying standing trees from them and then selling them for uh, either to be cut up into boards or to be cut up into veneer. So he was a very clever businessman and he chose Indiana. He went all the way across the United States when he was a kid or after college. One of the summer jobs was out in Washington, upstate New York, uh, in, in Oregon. He was in Oregon near Mount Hood the volcano that exploded years ago. So my father did this epic road trip across the United States. And on the way back, he interviewed at different places to find where do I want to go and start my life? Where am I going to find my fortune? He, he kind of did the speed dating for a place to live. Kind of. And he did a few interviews and with different logging places and 
he realized that central Indiana was the place to be for good, high quality veneer hardwoods, walnut, maple, cherry, wood that you could, you could buy a tree and turn it into a lot of money if you knew what you were doing. And I see and he did. was offered a job at a, at a large paper mill as a, as a grader. So he was out in the log yard and logs would come in and say, okay, turn that one into pallets, turn that one into boards, turn this one into veneer. These hundred pallets, these ten boards, this one, send that to the veneer pile. So he he was just like became a, a master of knowing what kind of woods were out there. And then he and his friend started. He saved his money every month, like eight years. He said, I'm gonna put fifty dollars a month in the bank every month, no matter what it takes. He built all the furniture in his first house. He, he got an old couch, reupholstered it himself. He was a real scrimper and saved and money, saved money. Do you think and that then, had an effect on you? Business. Oh, totally. Everything that I am is because of my mother and my father. And then this weird, somehow I got into the arts, but my father was like, you know, I remember watching TV one day and he said, it was a, a show about, World War II, the Holocaust, and it was a shot from inside the car, and it was a Nazi car, or it was the German military point of view, and there was the Mercedes emblem on the hood of the car. And my father said, do you know what that is? He said, I don't know. He said, someday I'm going to have one of those, the Mercedes, one of the best cars in the world. I'm going to have a Mercedes someday. And that really stuck in my mind. I was like, why would you want one of them? He's like, well, they're great tools. They're great cars. And they're kind of expensive. So, but someday I'm going to have one of those. And this is, you know, after he's built us a pool. And, you know, I felt like we were one of the wealthiest families in town. But we really weren't. But my father was really frugal and clever and he was always hustling. He'd go out and he'd run around to all these farms. You know, grandpa would die, the kids would inherit the farm, and then dad would go out and make a bid. There'd be a hundred trees in the woods and everybody'd show up with their little tally book. And they'd go out and they'd you know, go, okay, this is how much I'd buy it for. And they'd have these sealed bids. And so he would cut deals with farmers, buy their trees and not just go clear cut them. He was very, he's a very responsible, you know, an ecological minded tree guy. He was a proper woodsman. Proper woodsman. And one of my first jobs was tending one of his forests in the winter. So you'd have these weed trees that need to be thinned out so that the good trees can grow. So you go around, you poison the weed trees whack them with an axe and then squirt um, whatever in them so the but tree dies. Easy. And then the tree needs to be harvested or, you know, cut out. So I was too, I was old enough to run a chainsaw, but my father said the way to do this is you'll go out in the woods and put an ad in the paper, $8 a pickup load, all you can pile on your truck, you cut it yourself. And Brian, you go to the woods and you manage the operation. People will come and, uh, you know, you make sure they don't cut the good trees and they just cut the bad trees. Make sure nobody tears anything up and you collect the money. We'll give one dollar to the advertising cost and you can have the rest. So I spent many weekends in the winter out in the woods. And I cut one load of firewood myself and sold it for $35. And I said, it's not worth it. I'm just going to, I'll be the middleman and take people's money. But uh, cutting firewood, that's, so I went from being a rock sweeper to a firewood, possibly a firewood cutter. Um, so instead of cutting firewood, I built a, a huge lean-to. I built my office out in the woods with an insulated floor out of tree bark and 
And it was quite cold. It's snow on the ground. But I would spend Saturday and Sunday in the woods, kind of like a survivalist in my mind. But I was probably only out there four or five hours. It wasn't like I was on an Arctic expedition. But I was kind of on my own and taking care of myself and, you know, seeing the business. And then a gymnastics school opened up in town. So I was on a football team and I was wrestling. I was in the, in the band. And I was kind of a pseudo athlete, pseudo geek. It's in junior high. And then the gymnastics school opened in town. And I'm like, I want to go be a gymnast. I'm like, Dad, I got you. Got to take me into town. The gymnastics school is opening. You know, Saturday afternoon, I got to go and sign up for gymnastics school. Like, What's that all about? I'm like, yeah, I want to learn how to do a backflip. I want to do backflip. So, all right. So I go into the. I spent the, the whole day in the woods, and then I go into the gymnastics school, covered in sawdust, with my work boots on and my, you know logging gear basically and I'm like hi I'm here to learn how to do a backflip you know and there are all these little girls in there you know like learning how to do back bends and you know and the the couple that opened it Brent and Deborah Deborah was the uh, gymnast and Brent was the basketball star and Brent had gone off to college and they had gotten married and come back and then okay we're back we're gonna open the gymnastics school and I remember them thinking, who, you know what, did you lose a, is this a joke? What are you doing here? And I want to be a gymnast. The only, you know, like Brent, the basketball star dude even kind of thought, you know, like, what's up with this dude? And I ended up becoming, you know, I go there, but we became all really close friends and I was a serious gymnast. Um, in my mind for three or four years and Learned how to do backflips back handsprings Started competing moved from that gym to another a bigger gym In a different town hour away and my mother would drive me there a couple times a week And then I started to grow I get taller and I'm not I realize I'm not going to be a competitive gym um, I should have learned how to play basketball because I was tall and skinny. Because they're all diddy. Yeah, and here I'm like, I could never do a double backflip. And I could never, I wasn't really a good, uh, wasn't, I could never stand on my hands for very long. Could never really get it. But I could do backflips all day long, back handsprings all day long, front flips, can you, back can you still Can you still do? Um, I stopped doing backflips in my mid 30s and i don't remember the exact time that i stopped but i do remember the specific day when somebody asked me to do it and i said mm, now nah, i used to do that and i was about it was about 20 15 years ago or so okay. so why like did you 40 at, until about 40 yeah well, that's a fair Back flip until 40 is okay. Yeah. So you've realized this point. You've looked at gymnastics. You thought, okay, this isn't for me. I'm not going to be sweeping rocks off the road. I'm not going to be cutting timber. Okay, yeah. I'm not going to be a gymnast. So I want to be a movie director. Okay. I thought, I'm going to be a movie director. I saw the Star Wars, making of Star Wars. And my mother had a Super 8 video uh we had a super eight um like an old camera. camcorder kind of thing film camera film super eight film eight millimeter film and my grandmother gave my mother a super eight camera when my parents got married and then on a canoe trip my father and i had a we destroyed the camera it got soaking wet a uh waterproof bag wasn't sealed up correctly the camera got destroyed so dad bought a new one and this new camera had a stop motion feature on it and when i watched uh you could take one frame at a time which is how you make animated film and when i saw the making of star wars and how they did the animations 
that's when I thought, wait, whoa, I can do this. Our video, our film camera has a stop motion thing. But I didn't have a tripod. So I built a tripod out of these giant Tinker Toys that I had. I had are you familiar with Tinker Toys? Tinker Toys are I, I do know of them. Toys. Yeah, they're like a old, old tin toys. toys. Ah, this yeah, so we call it Meccano here. Then, so you have okay. the bolts to put them together. You can make. No, that's a. Uh, we call those a director set in the United States. The um, Tinker Toys were wooden, so you'd have wooden spokes, like the hub of a, a wagon wheel, and then you'd have wooden dowels that you could stick in the various holes. So you can make different shapes okay. out of and different creations out of wood. Yeah. Now I had a set of giant tinker toys, which the pieces were big. You had the 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 hubs were like this big around, and the pieces varied in length from maybe you know, ten centimeters to the longest one being fifty centimeters long or something. But the angles of the joints are determined by, you know, the, the pieces are fixed. So in order to get my camera where it needed to be, I had this huge tripod that was the size of my bed. The base was so big and I had had it mounted and that was how I kept the camera steady. And I started making Super 8 film. The first one I did. After I did the first one, my parents realized, oh, this guy needs a tripod. So we broke down and got a tripod. But I made several stop motion animations when I was in junior high school. Even even the um, I mean, this might have even been before I was in junior high. I might have still been in elementary school when I made my first one. And I would use clay and make different characters, and then move you know take a picture, move it, take a picture, move it, take a picture, move it. And the the final products are ten seconds long or something, but it would take forever to do. And you had to wait until it got developed to see, you know, you'd have to send it off to the place to get it developed. And, it, and the film roll is three minutes long. So I have 30 second thing embedded in, you know, I have to wait until we use this roll of film up. And you don't just like, oh, okay, we're going to just run it, you know, because it costs money. It was like $6 a roll or something. By the time you got done, I would make a movie and then wait a couple months until the film got used up and then we get it back and then I could finally see my movie. Um, so it was a bit frustrating. Were they uh, any good? I have a couple that are worthy of showing people the fine, the, the later products, but I got really frustrated because of all the time involved in the production and the cost and the, you, you spend all this time making it. And then you show it in a dark room and it's over and that's it. No applause, no, no, no you know. It's like, hmm, okay. But if you're going to be in the entertainment business, there's two things to do. Make movies and produce rock and roll shows. And that's what I thought I wanted to do. I'm going to be a stadium show producer and make movies and I thought that was my destiny I'm gonna go to Hollywood and I'm gonna become the next Steven Spielberg George Lucas you know that's what I thought I was going to do so in high school I went to a workshop out in UCLA raised all the money myself so I want to go to UCLA for a week so, well good luck with that we needed six hundred dollars or something. Well, you got to sweep a lot of rocks and cut a lot of firewood for that. So I went to the Lions Club and all the civic organizations in town and did a little presentation, asking for handouts. And I raised all the money to go. And in return, when I came back, I did a little presentation, to talk about what I learned and stuff. So, so what was it like? Fundraiser. Ah, it was fabulous. It was intriguing. And one of the speakers was a guy from NBC TV. 
he was the director of current comedy. He was the guy in charge of the development and management of all the sitcoms at NBC, which are three major networks in the United States at that time. NBC was one of them. Um, that's the network that the Letterman show was on. And um, maybe even Saturday Night Live. I can't remember what mm -hmm. network Saturday Night um, Live. Said. So what was interesting about what he said then? I don't really remember what he said. I do remember afterwards going up and introducing myself. And by this time I'm, I'm, I'm performing. And he said, I'm Brian, juggling performer from Indiana, an upcoming film producer, event producer. We chatted for a few minutes. This was between, this was my junior year of high school. Or between my, yes, my, in the United States, we have four years of high school. And this was my, between my fourth, third and fourth year, I think. So you're reaching the end of your schooling now. So you really are thinking yeah. about what to do. After. Yeah, yeah. Like, I want to go to UCLA. I'm going to go to film school, either UCLA or or uh, Stanford, but Stanford's a private school, cost a fortune, so probably not going to go there. And my dilemma was UCLA was affordable if you were from California, but if you're from out of, out of state, it was quite expensive. So I had this dilemma. The deal was my father would pay a third. I would use a third of my a third would come from savings and a third would come from some kind of, uh, you know, student um, loan or some kind of financing tool. And that was kind of the college tuition plan. And from childhood, I'd always been saving money. So I had money saved up, you know, towards the goal of at my parents' um, uh, direction or advice or whatever it's just what you do you know here's a hundred dollars for christmas put it put it in the bank or here's ten dollars for your birthday put it in the bank a, a, a sterling silver piggy bank that my grandmother gave me when i was born still have it filled with silver dollars i still have them all um so I was brought up with this idea, you know, money isn't for spending, money is for saving for the freedom to do what you want to do in the future. Um, Good advice save, there, everyone. Yeah, save your money. It's not, money isn't for spending. Anybody can spend money. I'm really good. Don't spend it. Yeah. So, and that came from my father. Um, so, so what happened after you left school then? Uh, well, you're, we, you're we, not you're not Steven Spielberg, so obviously something else happened. I went to Hollywood and thought I worked on a few films, and I looked around and went, "Hmm, I'm not the only one that wants to do this, am I?" Wow. Well, that David Newman said should suggested that you want to go to UCLA and you want to do it affordably. You should finish your high school here. You should just move. You should just stay here and finish your senior year, finish your fourth year of high school in California. You'll become an in-state resident. You can go to school cheap. And I will give you a job at NBC. I'll give you the job that I got when I graduated from film school. You can come be work in the mail room on the uh, weekends. You can be the, the guy delivering the mail. I'll be a high school senior working at NBC as a mail mail boy. And that'll be, that's your, if you want to do what you said. And I talked to the guy for 10 minutes and he said, and while you're in town, would you be interested in coming and seeing and uh, doing a, an audition? Why don't you come in? We'll, we'll, I'll get a casting director to check you out and come do your so juggling this is, job. Well. This is like a go, uh, golden opportunity, surely. Not it everyone was. gets the chance for that. Not everyone. And it's interesting. Not everyone gets the chance. I created it. I went to, there were 500 people in the audience and I was the guy that went up to him after I introduced myself and got his card and got invited to meet him at his office. No, nobody else in that group did that. So, and when I said I want to go, 
my father and mother didn't say, okay, yeah, we'll buy you a ticket. We'll take you there. You know, was, you got to cut a lot of firewood to do that. And it's summertime, so nobody wants to buy. You, you got the money? You got the money? No, but I'll get it. And I got it, and I went. And I went early and stayed out long. And did you take the audition? I did. How did it go? <laughs> I remember the expression. There were three people, David and these two people from the casting department. And I remember the casting lady and her assistant looking over at David like, okay, is this, this, I don't get the joke. This is a joke, right? Like, did, is it April Fool's Day or something? Why did you, why is, why are we here watching this kid from Indiana do this terrible juggling show? He's crap, he's a terrible juggler. He's, he, there, there's nothing special about this kid. Why, why did you have us come to see him? It was, it, and and I knew, I I realized it too. I was like, mm, I'm not Robin Williams, am I? I'm not, I'm not the guy. So I was good at putting myself in the place and seeing where to be, but I wasn't the genius performer. I wasn't, you know, like like Sean Penn. It's like this that 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 kind of era. Like Sean Penn was in a movie, um, uh, Fast Times at Ridgemount High, and he played the stoner skateboarder guy, Spicoli. And just assume that Sean Penn was Spicoli. But no, no, it turns out that Sean Penn was acting like the stoner skateboard dude, because he knew how to act. And he knew, I had taken, I was aware of things and theatrical things and I had done a lot of plays but I never had a real mentor I never had a real it was always kind of like I was playing theater I wasn't and I never had the uh, the naive conception that I was a special chosen one like I'm a great actor or I have to be a great actor I need this it, it was never like this like oh this is cool I can do that I'll do it uh, and people are like oh wonderful great someday you'll go to Hollywood and be a big star and then you get there and they, like roll their eyes and then and I went so down to Venice Beach with my kit I went down to Venice Beach with my kit and I'm like okay I'm doing a show and I look around and there's Robert Gunnard the original as far as we know, chainsaw juggler at Venice Beach, the guy who inspired Mad Chad and and who inspired all everybody, you, everybody. Yeah. I suppose, as far as I can gather, Robert was Grenard first. was the first street performing chainsaw juggler who went on Johnny Carson and bragged about how much money he made. And within a week, the IRS repossessed all of his stock at his used car lot. And whoops. <laughs> ah. Yeah. So that was another great lesson to learn. Keep your mouth shut if you make any money. And my father always told me that too. So cash is great. Just make sure you know how and what to do with it. Don't put it in the bank. Don't spend it in a way that anybody can know that you had it. Just act like you're the poorest guy in the room. Cash is good. So what but, do you do after your realization that I'm not what I need to be? Well, in this I time? thought, well, I, 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 that it wasn't that like, I didn't just like throw my hands up, but in retrospect, I kind of think, ah, yeah, that if I would have known what to do in that situation, if I would have had a coach, a manager, uh, you know, a helicopter mom telling, grooming me, 
It wasn't just enough to be there and get your foot in the door. After you get your foot in the door, you really need to know what to do once you get in there. If not, you're just like a bull in a china shop. You're like, oh, oh, I'm from Indiana and I could do a juggling show and I want to be, I'm going to be an actor. And they're like, no, you're not. And you're like, oh, I'm not? Okay, well, I'll go back to Indiana. <laughs> All right, yeah. And, and so what happened? Did you go to back to Indiana? Well, I, I, called, I called dad and I said, I'm going to stay out here. I'm going to go. I met this guy, David. He's going to give me a job at NBC He's in the mail room on the weekend. I'm going to university here. And I'm going to go to high school, finish high school here, and then go to university. So that's. So you, yeah, you, you that's didn't a throw crazy away, idea. Then. Pardon? You didn't throw the I idea throw away. away. No, no, I thought it was a great no. idea until it wasn't really encouraged by my parents. They were like, yeah, that sounds like a harebrained idea. Why don't you just come back here? I'm like, oh, okay, I guess. So I didn't. At that time, if I had been, like, told, that's a great idea. We'll send you some money or uh, do whatever you want. It's your life. I don't care. But it wasn't like that. It was kind of like, no, that's probably not what you should do. Come on back. And so you accepted that by the sounds of it and you went back. Yeah, because, you know, if they were, if, and I had stuff going on too back in Indiana. I'd already started performing. My, Big street performance. So this was '86, and I had started performing. I had a steady gig, actually, in Indianapolis. So I kind of was obligated to go back, uh, at least a little bit. And this is the middle of June, and if I was actually going to do it, I would have had to been out to California by mid-August or something. So it was kind of last-minute, harebrained idea. In retrospect, it was the biggest, mis it was the biggest turning, that was one of the biggest turning points of my life. There's oh, wow. So, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, that was quite quick and shocking. I will call Brian as he's on. Quickly, I'd say, uh, how, is, how interesting it's been. It's been great to listen to Brian here and I'm coming up from America, from a different culture. Very, very different culture. Um, Hearing him do the puppet theatre, do the the theatre shows, the slow build up of of knowledge of theatre, but still being very practical about everything. He's as he said, he wasn't you know kind of blown away by it. He wasn't uh, impassioned. He was just being quite practical all the time, which is quite interesting. Because a lot of people you speak to, they're not practical about it. They do just you know write like a Disney story for themselves. And that Disney story is the thing they then live, try and live their lives from, for better or for worse. Uh, I'm just going to call Brian now and see if he's coming back. Lost power, back on, okay. So his laptop has gone. One of the things that we're going to talk about in a little while, which I'm particularly interested in, is about Brian moving to Japan. And I find this fascinating. From what I've been told, Brian is one of the guys who basically established Japan as a place that Western people can go and entertain there, as street pictures. He, he set everything up. Uh, Lee's comments in some of it. I'm going to do what everybody else does, and I'm going to read the really comments when people go up. Uh, also, he's one of the very few who speaks excellent, better than the average Japanese. So, yeah, he speaks fluent Japanese, made the effort. But just before I put Brian on, it appears his entire life what he's done is he's seen something and worked hard at it, which is interesting. All right, cool. Let's get him back in the room. And three, two, one. Welcome back. Oh, oh. Ah, a little bit of a little bit of juvenile humor there. Yeah. There you go. Uh, yeah, boogers and dick jokes, farts. That's the kind of world I came from. You know, that simple the, humor. That, everyone, everyone that understands that is that's comedy. That's comedy. Dick jokes, fart jokes, jokes. And now you know why I was a failure in L.A. Oh, but <laughs> let's tell your whole story. because wasn't sophisticated enough, you know? I, I will say so you've, definitely, you've definitely not been a failure for your life. You, you've Legends coming up to this interview have sat and commented on your ability to hold a crowd, your, 
your your power on there, holding a pitch together, your success. They've been incredibly complimentary about it. Lee Ross, oh. another guy who is, you know, an incredible entertainer. You know, so anyway, yes, you go back home. Yeah. And so you've gone back home now. Do you go back and yeah, so I went team? back. Um so one of the things that was going on in the parallel, this is we we kind of we were telling the story from childhood up to now and why I became a performer and yeah. and so my I mean, goal my hope was to do this film thing from a young age and I made some films and actually made a a, a, a monster movie as well like a, with actors and also did a um, silent film with um, uh, my friends like a gangster thing it was a uh, like film noir a school film. event and directed and acted in these films and did 14 plays 15 plays at civic theaters and high school theaters I cannot remember a time I wasn't involved with a production in high school and junior high and sometimes it was in two productions at the same time the school play and this local civic theater play um, so I'd go to rehearsal for the school and right after school from 3 30 to to whatever six and then from seven to eleven I'd go to the other place and, and, and did uh, you do that when you went back so when you went back from trying yes, to the Hollywood was, experience well, you went back that into was the up until I started performing as a professional street performer variety well, performer. Really when does that when does that begin like a 1986 okay. in Indianapolis there was a Indianapolis Indiana is the, the crossroads of America if you go east of Indianapolis if you go from New York City to the Mississippi River if you go from New York City to st. Louis you pass through Indianapolis and at Indianapolis if you turn north turn right you go to Chicago so there's a road that runs north and south from Chicago to the Ohio River, which is three hours south of Indianapolis. Three hours from Chicago to the Ohio River is six hours about, six, seven hours. And there's Indianapolis. And you go from Indianapolis, New York City, through Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indianapolis. You keep going to Missouri, and then you come to Mississippi River. So this was a major crossroads. And it's the nickname Indianapolis is the crossroads of America. So they built the first major national railroad station in the United States was built in Indianapolis, huge, the Union Station. And throughout the United States, there's Union Stations in major cities, which it was like the federal, the federal train station. And Indianapolis's Union Station at the time was the biggest one. So before World War One, it was like this major hub of rail transport. And then, of course, rail transport went into a decline. And eventually, this hub of transportation in Indianapolis became a derelict. Five trains a day go through it. You know, it used to be five trains in a minute would be going through. It was like Tokyo Station or something. And then it it was one of the busiest train stations in the United States, and then it went to being an abandoned mess. And the Indiana, and then the gent, all of the downtown Indianapolis, everybody moved to the suburbs and all the malls. So the downtown Indianapolis went into a decline, economic decline. And then there was the, in the 80s, there was this movement to, gentrify or to rebuild it's kind of what happened in Covent Garden you know let's go into this it, old it, abandoned place and liven it up yeah. and then they did that in New York City San Francisco Pier 39 that it started on the coast and then slowly uh, somebody in Indianapolis said hey why don't we turn Indianapolis Union Station into a festival marketplace like they did in St. Louis, like they've done at South Street Seaport in New York City. So, hey, I'm this guy, Bob Borns, comes up with the idea, give me a big pile of money and I'll turn Union Station into a festival marketplace. So Bob Borns ramrodded this deal and it was a huge, epic news. Union Station was built in 
early 19, uh, mid 19, uh, mid 1800s. So 150 year old train station reborn, reborn. And it's right next to the Hoosier Dome football stadium. So 60,000 seat uh, indoor stadium, dome stadium connected to the festival marketplace. And did it bring people back into the place? Oh, was the it was busy? amazing. The first two years that Union Station was open, everybody in the Midwest, everybody in Indiana, conventions came, the convention center and the, the Hoosier Dome, the big 60,000 seat football stadium connected to the convention center, connected to the big hotel, which was built into the train station itself as well. And they used old train cars as hotel rooms. Really cool. And then the, the train platform became a big food court and downstairs there were shops. So eateries, boutiques, uh, and then entertainers. They had an entertainment company on the main stage, singers and dancers. And there was myself, my friend Ross, my childhood friend who was one of the guys from fifth grade that learned to juggle with me and we ended up doing shows together. So Ross and I had been doing these little shows in junior high and the first couple of years of high school. We do the half halftime show at the ba basketball game or something. And someone, I was, I was, I wasn't interested in singing. I wasn't, I was a trumpet player. I thought I was going to be, another one of my passions was playing the trumpet. I was going to be a jazz musician. I was going to be a trumpet player. I went to Europe with a jazz band when I was 16, did a, or 17, did a five country tour with a, a jazz band. It's a trumpet playing juggler guy. And, um, one of my civic theater directors, when I was 15, 16 years old, said to the choral director at my high school, get, teach Brian how to sing, get Brian in one of your classes and teach him how to sing because I want to cast Brian in a musical. Dick Willis told, Judy Hubbard that. Dick Willis was the creative director at the Geyer Opera House. And the Geyer Opera House was an old vaudeville theater in this tiny town of like 50 people that Dick Willis and a bunch of other people had been renovating and restoring and doing events at for years. And that's one of the places that I did my first juggling shows. When I was so in junior high. Ah, so yes. So the, the so streets junior high school. Yes. Yeah, so still in the early 80s, 1981, 82, uh, Dick Willis has this community theater in the middle of nowhere. It's unbelievable. This It doesn't even have a stop. I, it's like one stoplight town. You know, 20 minutes to the 15 minutes east of my my town, heading east on the national road. So my Indiana used to be the, as I explained, it was the, the thoroughfare. Right. So if you wanted to go west from New York city, you went through, you went right through my old door yard. So on, you're catching the people who are passing through who are stopping potentially. Used the rest to, or whatever. But then when the interstate system was built, my town and all the little towns along the national road 40 were bypassed by the interstate. And, all of these towns throughout the Midwest, just like everywhere in the world, when the interstate system goes in, the little towns fossilize. They stopped growing. So about the time I was born, the interstate system was created, finished in Indiana. And that's why when I was born in 1968, there were 2,000 people in that town. And 51, 52 years later, there's still 2,000 people in that town. It, nothing's changed. It's it's actually like declining. Everything around it, the big hubs near the interstates, everything's growing. But my main street in my town used to have all these little shops, boutiques. You go 20 minutes down the road, there was a vaudeville theater. Every every major little stop would have a hotel 
and eateries and things. It had a service economy. But it, it, the minute I was born, it started to go downhill when that interstate went in. So it was kind of a, it was a really unique time to be a kid. I think my generation was the last great generation. The class of 87, because I know the class of 80, 88 and on, they had a totally different experience. I remember when I was 14, the computer club had a guy bring the first Apple Macintosh. I was 14, so I was like, whoa, this is amazing. So to be 14, the next year, the people who were, everything changed. Everything changed when I was about 14 years old. When the Macintosh came out, it like changed history, changed everything. So the interstate system happened when I was born, when I was 14. Steve Jobs introduced the Macintosh into a lot of schools throughout the country. And then Bob Borns built Indianapolis Union Station when I was 16. And Judy Hubbard had coaxed me into the choir department and put me in the swing choir, the show choir. And I'm like, I don't want to take choir. He's like, well, you, you, you've got to. Dick Willis told me to teach you to sing, and you're a showman. So you're in the, sh you're, you're in the show choir. I'm like, Ugh. but I got to take U.S. history. I, there's no time on my schedule. We'll, we, you've got to figure it out. You got to take this history class, the required class. And you can take two elective classes. You can take one elective. You can either take choir or band or study hall. And she's like, well, there's a way to do it. You can do a, you can take your history class through independent study. You can do it through the mail, through Indiana University. You can free up a, a semester. So or you can free up a, a, an hour in your day. So you can come, to, you can be in the band, you can be in the choir, and you can take history. So they really wanted you. Yeah, Judy, Judy Hubbard and Dick Willis had a huge influence on my life. Because it was in Judy Hubbard's office one day, I saw the Indianapolis Star open to a page that said, Jugglers Wanted, audition Saturday. Come audition, entertainers wanted for the Union Station Entertainment Company. And it just happened to be on her desk, and I just happened to see it. And I said, Ross, like, we should go audition. We should go to this audition. Maybe we can meet some other juggler who we can learn something from. I had no idea, we did not even the inkling that we would, you know, get hot. We thought we'd go there to, you know, like, learn something. And the only other juggler that was at the audition watched us warm up and left without auditioning. Oh, wow, good compliment. So we got the job by the call, because <laughs> we were the only juggling duo that went to the Indianapolis audition. And there was one other guy in college who had auditioned at the university, Indiana University, a couple hours south of Indianapolis. But he lived in down at the university, so he would have to commute two hours to get to in to Union Station. So during the summer, he was there quite a bit. But when the school year kicked in, he was hardly ever there. Steve Regatz. So and Steve Regatz was a proper juggler. He's still a proper juggler. He's an artistic juggler, and he's. I remember one of the descriptions, one of the things that is out there in the peanut is, uh, oh yeah, Brian Hulse has always been a breadhead. It was a comment that Steve Regatz had made in a conversation. What's it? What does it mean? A breadhead is somebody, a bread is American slang. Oh, money, so you, money. Yeah, you got money on your mind. Brian Hulse has always been a breadhead. There's like maybe my name's been mentioned in the peanut maybe five times. And I think it was instigated by Robert Nelson talking about um, epic money makers. And Steve Regatz was like, oh yeah, Brian's always been a breadhead. And it wasn't that I'm a, it's not that I'm a breadhead, but I don't want to be homeless. Yeah. Um, 
And I remember when Chad, Chad uh, Taylor's uh, busting movie for the love of money or something. And he went around the world and interviewed like 80 people. And he featured, I don't know, 10 or something in his movie. Are you familiar with this movie? No, no, I'm not. I've got to see it. Oh, oh wow. I can't believe I missed it. Oh, yeah. Um, Chad Taylor's movie is uh, definitely, that's somebody you've got to have on. What's definitely. going on in my super duper? Oh. So, so Brian's got a full multimedia setup going on here. Um, let's see. Uh, Chad Taylor, for the love of money, busking movie. We'll give him a little commercial here. This is where we need a production assistant Googling this stuff. Oh, it would um, be lovely to have production assistant. I wouldn't have to share everything. I wouldn't have to worry about technical Chad issues. Taylor. Oh, oh. Hold on. So we have Siri. Chad Taylor, busking movie. Oh, and it. The, this is. So, uh, while are you doing that? Second. Look, look, look what I'm. Uh, I'm googling on my iPad so that you guys can see. Uh, and I'm going to have to fire my production assistant because Siri obviously doesn't. Um, we're still a very minor tribe because Siri doesn't recognize the word busker. She wrote, or it, if we, I don't know, is Siri an it or a she or a he or whatever. Siri is an it, very much an it. it. Okay, so uh, I said Chad Taylor busking movie, and instead it came up with Chad Taylor busty movie. So I'm afraid to hit search. Maybe maybe, maybe it's a different maybe it's a different Chad Taylor working it, a different. It'll industry. be um, yeah. We're gonna not get a and and but it's kind of ironic because his subtitle or his sub um the uh, the catch copy for his movie is is it for the for, for the, the love, love of money for love or for the love of money. And that's kind of the question. And he's why do you do this? Is it for the money? And everybody was like, no, no, it's not for the money, but. Well, do it for free then. Uh, no, I don't want to do volunteer work later. So yeah. So so, but um, were you were yeah. you were booked also, for this? So the busty movie, you can imagine we're going to come up with a bunch of porn, and you yeah. ask the people in porn, you're like, oh, you do it, you like, oh, I love it, I love it. It's like, okay, well, come do it with me for free. Oh no no no! You got to pay me. Hold on a second. I thought you. We're in porn because you love sex, not because you so love So as much as I'm loving this this discussion on the ethics of uh, economics in porn. And when you did, info, I'm not even drinking wine yet. I'm still on go. morning coffee. And I'm it's early over there for you. Yeah, it's so, uh, 9 Brian, when you start when you started working at the railway then, you were booked for that. That wasn't an uh, open slot. Yes, it wasn't like it a was, busky uh, slot. All right. It, it, was, it was booked busky, right? It was, I was, uh, so this is the movie, everybody. Buskers for the Love of Money. Chad Taylor, the chainsaw juggler of Venice Beach, who's now epic. Chad Taylor, you got to get Chad Taylor on this show. Definitely. Everybody, uh, Google is the Chad guy Taylor. Is the guy in the background, is that, what's the name of the guy who did Key West on the road? Uh, to be the guy, it? guy of Key West. No, Will Soto. Is that... Will Soto. Is that Will, Will Soto, Soto in the background there? No, that's not Will Soto, but Will Soto is probably in this film. Um, I'll just play the trailer in the background as I talk, um, if it works. Because this was kind of the idea I had when... And we just turn the uh, sound off. There. Um, so, yeah, it was a booked pitch then, right? So when you work in the train station, yeah. it's just been oh, refurbed. Look, Richie Rich. Rich, 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 Richie Rich is in this, and you know, Chainsaw Jugglers. And, but um, the reason I brought this up is I've been mentioned on PNET maybe five times. Steve Regatz referred to me as a breadhead, which, mm, okay. He knew me from my first year. And... Um, and then there was uh, 
my quote in this movie is um, we're driving around in Japan and I say, we, and this is after Chad has seen me do a show for like 5,000 people in this huge amphitheater. And, and like, and this was the peak of my career, the year that Chad Taylor came and hung out with me for five days, followed me around, saw me doing all these crazy shows, huge, huge, and just working it. And he was kind of like, holy cow, I can't really put Brian in. And Brian's, this isn't busting like everybody else is busting. This is, this is a different thing. And he's really not that. So I ended up with like a tiny little, my claim to fame in Chad's movie is, yeah, people think we make a lot of money. We don't make a lot of money. Bill Gates makes a lot of money. 10, 20, 30, 100, 200, 300 thousand dollars a year. That's not a lot of money. Like 2,000, 200 thousand dollars a minute while you're asleep. That's a lot of money. But street performers, oh, I did a hundred dollar hat. I did ten dollar hat, hundred dollar hat, thousand dollar hat, ten thousand dollar day. And be oh, you're making so much money. It's like, <laughs> no. Not really, no. Yeah, a thousand dollar show. Oh, but so how much time did it why take? Why was to your show so much that? bigger? Why was your show so much bigger at this time when Chad's come and flies around? Why, why are you something different? How did you get to the point of being a guy doing claymation with your parents to having this huge, powerful show? Right place at the right time. Okay, I was. I I've been lucky to have been in the right place at the right time and then being able to move within that. But what do you mean by saying the right place the right time? What place, what time? I was born in 1968 in Indiana in a town that was bypassed by the freeway. So I got to live this utopian, happy childhood in what I thought was the most idyllic setting I didn't yeah but brian your your t your town isn't all performers you said i know, I know, I know, guy. I know. there's another but guy because that because of that i i i gravitated towards performing out of sincere interest and curiosity that came from me as opposed to going oh look at that guy i want to do what he's doing so or, did you not yeah, see all the street shows? Did you see Never. the street shows? And then, so how did you know, write your show to be so big then? Did you write it to oh, suit work, well, sheer time? I'm or? talking about, when I say I, I've been in the right place at the right time, over the years, my whole life has been a, one series after another of being in the right place at the right time. So I was born in this town. I grew up in this town. I, I was close enough to a city where there was a magic shop that my mother could go to once a year and buy me a gift. But it's not like I lived around the corner from the magic shop and hung out there all the time and became a, a prodigy of the magic shop guy. Huh. Or, um, you know, like Lee Ross and David Ramsey went to the School of the Performing Arts. And if you watch Lee Ross's early stuff, he's obviously very in, he learned so much from the people that he was with. You know, he had the, he, you watch early Lee Ross and it's, it's heavily influenced by the other pantomimes that were doing shows at the Met, right? So, I mean, which is fine. I mean, they grew up in New York City. I grew up in the cornfield. Um, who uh, can Who's uh, the guy from Kansas who does Robin Hood? Rex Boyd. Rex Boyd. So Rex yeah. Boyd. He kind of had the same. We grew up about the same time, but he was in Kansas. Much different than New York City. And look what he came up with. This whole. You know, he came up with something totally original, like Robin Hood, which was one of those stories that I did from those records with my mother. We did it as a play in fifth grade. We did it 
for the entire school and I provided the script but Robin Hood and, and then so years later when Rex Boyd came up with that Robin Hood character I chuckle it's like wow it's so weird it's two kids from the Midwest and we, we both have like some connection to Robin Hood um, he did it in England because it was we're all adapting to our environments and what our environments respond to and well, reward we'll talk, you've got a particularly interesting story in this and we'll talk about it in a little while but you adapted to a completely different environment so but yeah, i grew up you know. in indiana and by the time i got to san francisco by the time i decided oh okay here's my plan i want to go to ucla but to get it, uh, film school doesn't start until your third year. First two years, you have to take introductory humanities courses that everybody takes. Is, takes. So I'll go to UC Berkeley my junior and senior year, uh, my, my first two years, and I'll work at Pier 39 while I go to UC Berkeley. So I go out there with my show and, you know, hey, Brian from Indiana, what are you on vacation? No, I'm going to live here and work with you guys. Fuck off. There's already 13 of us. We can hardly pay our rent. I'm going to have to sell my boat. You know, like, what? You got a boat? Like, are you... why? I was very taken back by the, oh, welcome to town, tourist. Oh, you're not leaving? Ugh. Oh, great. Another juggler. Another Michael Davis spin um, oh, was was this hazing because i hear a lot of the common garden guys they talk about some of them at least not all of them uh -huh. talk about that when people join the pitch there was almost kind of like a you should fuck off kind of vibe for people oh to totally. try and get less people there but and it then wasn't they that it. it was i just it wasn't like um i think we're into somebody else's uh movies now let me get back to um, the screensaver there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Chad Taylor's busking movie. Everybody check that out um, and get Chad as a guest on your show. Definitely. Um, you asked me so why did I become massive show in Japan? Well, and it's all yeah. tiny, tiny, well, tiny, well, tiny. Before that, let's say lucky why to be in the right, right place at the right time. Born in this idyllic Midwestern town, grew up, mm, supported by my parents. You know, oh, you want to do that? My father was always like, I don't really understand, but yeah, I'll come and watch. Oh, <laughs> you know, he didn't, he didn't, he wasn't against it, but he wasn't there going, oh no, you need to do two behind the back throws first and then do the pirouette and that'll be much more effective, you know? No, he was like, supportive, like but that. Supportive, kind of in, and then my mother too. Yeah, you know, like yeah, do whatever you want. Just make sure you, you know, follow the rules, and the rest of the time you can do whatever you want. Yeah. And uh, no, you're not getting a motorcycle. You're not getting a computer. I wanted a computer, and I got a unicycle. Well, you did better with the computer, the unicycle, than the computer. Let's say this. I don't know. And this has always been a can, something I bring up when my parents. Well. Yeah, if I would have instead of getting a computer when I was if I would have gotten a computer when I was 12 instead of that unicycle, people would not even know who Bill Gates is. There you go. But since we've got a performative kind of angle, I'm quite interested with this. OK, interested with the idea of you before we go to Japan. About the okay. fact that you well, went to you went to uni, you I went was. to the pitch. You're getting I got a union kinda. station, union station, five dollars an hour, 40 hours a week. My partner and I, our job description was wander the hallways and entertain people. You can work up to 40 hours a week, make your own shift, clock in when you get here, clock out when you leave, wander the halls, and if you make any money in tips, you get to keep it. So this is the gig that you got when you this and your is friend the went to the... Yeah, yeah, we went to the audition, and they said, okay, you're in. We opened the end of March. This was, you know, middle of the winter in Indiana maybe January, February, we get this, all right, boom, we're in. We go to the gala opening of Union Station. 
epic. Beautiful black, you know, every, everybody in the country is talking about Union Station. And everybody in Indiana is talking about Union Station. The big gala, you know, uh, tuxedo event to open it up, you know, and yeah. all the who's who, you know, Sammy Terry, the monster guy, all the celebrities, local celebrities are there. It's huge. And everybody comes. Everybody jumps, you know, they're driving their tractors to the city and, you know, put the kids in the hay wagon. Let's go to the city. Yee hoo! Get an animal balloon and a corn dog. Yeah. We're going to the city. Wipe the shit off. And the how shoes. was that? What was the That's experience awesome. of you and your friend like? Well, that? but our show was, you know, there are these two kids from this podunk town, you know, doing our little goofy juggling show and being watched by all of these people from Indiana who had never, you know, maybe they'd seen a show in New York City when they went there as a tourist or something but you know this it, is something not, special in your local place yeah and you know so and we were cute and before you know we started getting you know people calling up and saying hey we want you to come and you know um Jiffy Lube Oil change job that was one of my first corporate gigs I remember um and uh open so hey, did you guys did you guys really sorry to interrupt? Uh, did you guys um, do a lot of gigs and then you went to university after that and met these guys on the pitch where they're closing the pitch now where they're trying to tell you to fuck off? Uh, well, that was that was a bit later. Okay, that was so that was, that, was uh, the the exciting thing for me that I be, love before we do that I just, that I just want to Union Station thing yeah yeah please and what do. is it you would like to hear? No, no, please tell us about the beginning of Union Station. Mm. So yeah, um, so we can give the, once we get this edited, we can cut out all this extraneous crap, but we got to give the guy, the editor, his uh, stuff to work with. So yeah. puppets from eight, magic, juggling, juggling IJA conventions, meet Waldo and Arsan and all these other great jugglers. Anthony Gatto, I was at the premiere of Anthony Gatto. Anthony Gatto and I, our, the first juggling convention that Anthony went to, I was at. I was hanging out with Anthony Gatto. He was really young, but we were like, me and a bunch of the other kids, I can remember kind of like, I mean, Anthony was so young. He was like five or something, right? Wow. And I was 12, 13. And I'm like, who's this? Oh, my God. Anthony Gatto and Bobby May met on stage. I saw that and thought, holy cow, hmm, well, technical juggling, that's a lot of work, but our son and Waldo, that's kind of cool. Hmm. So uh, jump ahead to 1986, Union Station, opening event, and then start working 40 hours a week, going there on the weekend. So Friday, I'd finish school at 3.30, and I'd try to be over there for 5 o'clock show. And, um, and are you hatting at this point? Or are they still yeah. raging? Well, I don't know how to hat yet because I've never really seen any street, you know, much street performing. But then I start to figure it out. And I remember after six weeks, I remember one Saturday, we worked 10 hours on the clock and we counted up our money at the end of the day and we had $100 in cash. And we had worked for 10 hours. So it was like, dude, we just made a hundred bucks each. This is gonna be a good summer. This wasn't even summer yet. It was still, we were still in school. And I'm like, this is gonna be a great summer job. This maybe isn't just a summer job. This will pay for college. This is, I'm gonna work 12 hours tomorrow. So I took my hundred bucks, went home. Well, I didn't even go home. I was couch surfing. I left. I left um, Knightstown in in my uh, father's. It was I was using my mother's car, which was, of course, a Mercedes. My father's dream came true. He had a his and hers Mercedes, exact same car, three hundred D. And one was the company car and one was the family car. But since 
both cars used the same parts. The company car was always needing something repaired. It went through twice as many parts as a normal company car would go through. Because he had two in the same car, he could write this, write everything that needed to be fixed on mom's car. He could write it off and say it was, oh yeah, we needed tires twice. We needed uh -huh. starter twice. So it was clever, right? It's, it's tax avoidance, not tax evasion. He's like, it's your patriotic duty to not pay taxes. Because the more you give them, the more they're going to waste it. So use the rules to your advantage and figure out how to make as much as you can and keep as much as you can. Because if you just follow the rules the way they tell you to, they'll take everything and you won't have anything left. So when you think you want, don't do what everybody else does and don't do what everybody tells you to do. Figure out what you want and go and do it. And keep your mouth shut. And that's why nobody has so, heard of me. That's why nobody has heard of me. And that's why there's nothing up there on the YouTube about me. And I kind of like keep my, I've tried to keep my mouth shut for 35 years. Um, well, I'm very happy that you've joined us to tell your story tonight. I am, you know. You know? But tell us more about, so you're working this gig now. You're saving money for... Yeah, yeah, saving money for the future. Yeah. And um, so the next day, Sunday morning, I get up early and I go down there and, you know, I'm like there when they open the door. And I'm in, you know, I start shows at 11.15 instead of 12. And waiting for my partner to come. And I'm well, not waiting, but I'm doing shows. And like after the fourth show, I go up to refuel my fuel bottle from my fire eating routine. And there's Ross sitting in the dressing room saying, well, why didn't you wait for me? I'm like, I told you I was gonna start early. Why didn't you just jump in? You show up and jump in the show when you get here, you know? Oh, well, you know, I took my money and went out to the, I, I went out on a date with Tammy. And, and you know, so uh, he spent his $100. And by the time he came to work the next day, I already had gotten started towards my next hundred. And I'm like, you know, make, you know, either shit or get off the pot, you know. So did you guys drift work, the pot from this? Slowly started to deteriorate. It slowly deteriorated. And Tammy, and was, did you come Tammy was one of the, a woman was one of the key women in money. Uh, not just women, but romantic relationships and money influence so much in our lives they're like the instigation they instig those are two elements in in human relations that and so when did you realize that it was the the end point of drifting park you must have had a moment where you're like well i suppose i'll go on my own oh We were seniors in high school. It, it, we worked, we lasted at Union Station together as a team for, oh, I, I don't know. But it wasn't even a year. I don't and did you keep working after that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like never stopped. I've never stopped working since. Like, and so what happened after Union Station then? Did you work, you work Union Station? Okay, so Union, Union Station and then the, the Jiffy Lube dude, dude calls up. I'm opening a quick oil change place and, you know, maybe you could, I'm going to have a hot dog vendor and you could come and do shows while people wait. I'm like, ah, well, you know, when, when Saturday morning, can you come by for three hours? I'm like, all right, 50 bucks an hour, I'll come. We'll hang out in the parking lot. And make animal balloons for the kids. And, and uh, He's like, this was great. Could you come back again tomorrow? I think it was first, it was uh, two hours the first time. And then he's like, can you come back tomorrow for three hours? He's like, all right, cool. So then a couple of weeks later, the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra calls. And they do Symphony on the Prairie, this old uh, outdoor uh, colonial town replication, kind of like a museum type settlement thing. There's a huge field where they do the Symphony on the Prairie 
series every summer and people come out and do picnics on the hill and watch the symphony. Could you come and do your juggling show for an hour before the symphony starts and wander around the picnic grounds and do your show? And I said, yeah, sure. Um, well, how much is it? Is it $50 an hour? Okay, so there's two of you, that's uh, $50 an hour a piece. And I said, very calmly, I said, oh yes, of course. So, okay, we'd like to book you for um, five nights, hour a night. And I said, okay, can we get some comp tickets too? Oh yeah, you can get as many comp tickets as you want. Just tell us in advance and, and you know. And the tickets are like $25 a piece or something, right? Or whatever, $25 a family or whatever it was. But it was pretty epic to be able to say, hey, mom, free tickets to the, you know, we got all access passes to the symphony on the prairie. It's kind of a big deal. And then on yeah. around 4th of July, it's the symphony and the live fireworks show. So in Indiana, this is like one of the highlights of the year. You got the symphony on the prairie fireworks show. You got the big pig at the state farm, at the state fair in August. You get to go see the biggest pig in the state. And then, you know, you got the Christmas show. And then... And are you, are you developing a kind um, of uh, personality in the area now? You are yeah, a performer. Yeah, because I start to become a local celebrity. You know, he's got a TV, stadium, a TV studio in the Union Station. And every morning, Dick, Dick Wolfsey has the Dick Wolfsey show from Union Station. And out the, you know, his studio looks out over the food court. So every morning, everybody in Indiana can see Dick Wolsey from live from Union Station. And hey, who do we have today? Oh, it's Brian the Juggler. And Brian and Ross, the jugglers are here again. Hey, what are you guys going to do this for us today? We do the exact same thing we did last time, just in a little different style. And uh, so, and then, you know, all the members of the, the Union Station Entertainment Company with the dancing guys. And then we had a puppet guy. John Kennedy, the puppet guy. Um, we had Stephen Hart, the magician. We had uh, Tomato, Sweet Tomato, and a couple others who were the uh, balloon clowns. And uh, Jesse, who came later, he was a balloon twister. And um, Steve Regatz, the juggler. Were you, and were you sad when you left to go to uni? Were you, were you sad well, about the fact that you're leaving your... It is. your yeah. Get this. I didn't leave to go to uni. I, uh, as I'm getting toward my, during my junior year of high school, uh, Epic Hollywood Film, or my sophomore year of high school. It's so my sophomore year of high school, so I'm 15, and an Epic Hollywood Film came to Indiana. It's called Hoosiers. Hoosiers is a uh, one of the epic sports films of Hollywood. It's a basketball film starring Gene Hackman and Dennis Hopper. And they used my childhood elementary school gymnasium as the home team gymnasium. And they cast all of our local kids as extras in the movie. And they needed a trumpet player for the pet band. They needed a, a five, like a seven piece pet band to be principal extras to appear at every game and in the classroom scenes. So I heard that the movie was coming to Indiana and I said, I'm going to be involved with this. And then I heard, oh, they're coming to Knightstown and using my gymnasium as one of the locations. I was, I'm definitely, that's the state, that's the gymnasium where I did Robin Hood as a director actor when I was in fifth grade. I was like, I know that venue. I know that place like the back of my hand. I'm going to be involved. And then they call the high school and say, we need a seven piece pet band. The band director, Bob Edwards says, uh, Brian, would you like to be the trumpet player in the pet band? It's like, they called me. So Ross, my juggling partner, he played the baritone. I played the trumpet. We were all in the movie together. And then the art crew would come to prep the gymnasium a few, a couple months before the shoot. So after school, I would go down and hang out and help the art crew. And I became like an art department intern on this movie. And the people I met on that movie are some of the people that I visited later when I went to UCLA 
workshop, I went and stayed with people who I met on that film before the workshop started. They picked me up at the airport and dropped me off at the apartment of the other guy that I was going to stay with and blah, blah, blah. So tiny. A Hollywood movie comes to Indiana once every, what, lifetime? And they came to my hometown of 2,000 people and used my childhood gymnasium. And then they called and asked me to be in the movie. Unbelievable. So we do that, and then Union Station opens. And while I'm working at Union Station, this woman from the Indiana Film Commission, we had become friends during the Hoosiers thing because in post-production, Hoosiers people call Indiana Film Commission and say, we want to use, we need to know the song that the pep band plays in this scene and all the, all the movie, all the basketball scenes, all the games. There in the soundtrack, there's this song being played. We need to know who's the copyright holder and can you help us? She's like, okay, let me see what I can do. So then she calls Knightstown High School. They put them through to the band director. The band director says, oh, here, Brian, um, talk to this lady from the film commission. Or no, I don't think I was in the office. I was in the office and the secretary of the school said, Phyllis says, uh, oh, Oh, the movie? Oh, hold on a second. Here's Brian, who's the trumpet player in the Pet Man. Brian, it's the Indiana Film Commission. So I get a hello, oh, this is Brian Alt. Um, oh, you were looking for the, the copyright holder of the person who wrote that song you guys played in the movie. I said, well, let me check on that and get back with you. Get her number, da 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 da. And I'd always heard my father doing business on the phone at the house, so I knew how to talk in a business like way. I just mimicked what my father would say. Let me check on that and get back with you. And you know, I hang up and I'm like, Phyllis, secretary of the high school. I'm like, Phyllis, I got to find the, how do I find the, the copyright holder for the song we played in the movie? It's the Manchester fight song. So I said, well, let's, let's call Manchester High School and find out what we can find out. So we get on the phone, call Manchester High School. It turns out that the band director at Manchester High School wrote the song, was copyright holder, his name's blah, blah, blah. And yeah, so within 15 minutes, I call back to the Indiana Film Commission lady. She turns around, calls back to Hollywood. She looks like a star, right? She's like, oh yeah, I found out the information, here it is. And then she would see my show at the Union Station a year later. She's like, Brian, you know, oh, I, my office is just down the street. You're, you know, it's great. You made it all the way here from Indiana. And thanks again for hooking me up with that information I needed. Oh, by the way, there's a movie coming to town and they need production assistants. I gave them your name and told them you're going to call. So I go and get a job on this movie in the production office. And I tell them I can work Monday through Friday. And they're like, we'll, we can offer you $50 a day to be a production assistant in the office. I'm like, oh, okay. I said, but, you know, on Saturday, Sunday it might be tough. I said, well, we're, we're not in the office on Sundays as a rule. And Saturdays, yeah, we can probably, you know, why? I said, well, you know, I'm the juggler and I got to go do shows, you know. And it's kind of hard for me to, like, take myself away from that for $50 a day. It's, and they're like, oh, we understand completely. And you're, the tasks you're doing are really not that important. Um, so, yeah, yeah, well, perfect. You can be in the production assistant, office production assistant, you know, Monday through Friday, we'll have you doing stuff, like taking Charlie Sheen to the airport. Um, you took there Charlie Sheen to the airport? Yeah, it's like get, get everybody tickets to the U2 concert. So John Cusack, Charlie Sheen, Christopher Lloyd, uh, huge names in this movie. It's a baseball movie. So there's a huge cast, Who's Who. It's called Eight Men Out, directed by John Sayles, one of the great American directors, independent directors. The, the people that I met on that film, are uh, their names still roll by in the credits every day. And my direct boss, ends up being the executive producer of Quentin Tarantino's latest film, uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. She's an Academy Award-winning producer working Martin Scorsese. 
and I see your name rolling by all the time. We're Facebook, but she, we had a few email exchanges when so, I realized that she was still in business or, you know, just, like we found each other on Facebook. Yeah. So I made all of these insane connections. So why, why, why not stay and work in film then? Why, why spend um, what I would imagine is a good portion of a human life traveling the world as a street entertainer? Well, the dilemma of, so I worked on that movie right out of high school, pretty much. And that spilled over into this first semester of college. So I'm like, oh, I'll take mom, dad, I, I'll go to college after Christmas, but I'm gonna work on this movie. So as I'm working on that movie, another movie comes along in Cincinnati, Ohio, two hours south of Minneapolis. And I hear about that and say, so I'm gonna go get a job on that movie with Molly Ringwald and Andrew McCarthy. Who at the time, Molly Ringwald's from The Breakfast Club. She was huge. She was like, the starlet of the 80s, John Hughes films, hit after hit after hit after hit. I'm going to go work on that Molly Ringwall movie. So I asked my boss, you know, can I get a letter of reference or something? And so uh, let's see if I should make a phone call or if I should write a letter. I'll let you know after lunch. So after lunch, they, she says, oh, Brian, you have an appointment on Monday. We're giving you Monday off. You go down there. A friend of mine's on the on the show. We've set you up with a interview. Go down and get the job. So I go down and get the job. They say we'll hire you as a local. You have to find your you can find your place your own place to live. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, no problem. I I have a place to stay in Chicago, uh, in Cincinnati. Tina and Gina, who I had met during a show, they came to the U2 concert. After the U2 concert, I ran back to the pitch and did shows. So I went to U2 concert sitting next to John Cusack and Charlie Sheen. And then the show's over. He's like, ah, I got to go do a show. Run over to the show, meet Tina and Gina after the show. Oh, this is really cool. We're up from Cincinnati. Oh, exchange phone numbers. Maybe someday I'll do a show in Cincinnati. A couple months later, I'm like, hey, girls, I need a place to live. Oh, okay. I can live in Tina's room and you can have my room. So I move in with these two chicks that I met just out of the boot, you know, doing shows. Again, timing, right place, right time, and moving and, you know, hustling. Yeah, no problem. I can get a place to live. In. I'm there. So I drive down to Cincinnati to work on this movie. It spills over into end of January, beginning of February. Boom. So, okay, I got to sit out another semester of college. So, February, Indiana, cold, movie ends. What are we going to do? Will Soto is doing the Busker Festival down in Key West. All right, I'm going to go to the Buster Festival down in Key West. So I jump in the car. My sister and I, my sister goes with me. She loves Florida. So we drive to Key West, Florida, go to the Busker Festival. And that's the first time I met. This is 1988 Busker Festival, February of 1988. And that's when I met, meet everybody as a performer. And there is Robert Nelson and Will Soto, uh, Locomotion Vaudeville, these guys from Boston, Cyrus Bounce, Ooh La La, um, Jeff Moshe. There's a, whole, there's a whole bunch of people down there. And then there's up and coming people. Um, myself and Mickey O'Connor, uh, we were the, the Young Bucks. And Gazzo was there. Gazzo and Bertie McLean. And I watched Gazzo's show, watched Robert Nelson's show, and I watched Gazzo's show like six times in a row. And I knew what he was doing, and I couldn't catch him. And I was just amazed. I could not, but I've got it right here. This is like my tribute pile. Right there. Boom. Oh. You got to get him on his show. He will Gazzo be on. He's is, he's on at the end of August. His everything, the optimization okay. of effort, comedy timing. I was just 
flabbergasted. And then I was like, man, I shouldn't. Have. I'm like, oh, so that's how you do magic. Hmm. Magic's actually better than the juggling show. This Gazo, this is freaking brilliant. But it's Gazo's show. Or it's, you know, it's like, I can't do that magic. I never catch up. And then Will Soto walking the rope and like, yeah, that's good, but you got to tie it up and everything. I'm like, ah, oh, that unicycle. I can ride a unicycle. Yeah. And I've got, I had a tall unicycle. So I kind of started and watching Robert and I'm like, wow, that's kind of, everybody called me the larva boy. Well, it's larva, funny. Lee did mention in comments, uh, butterfly boy. Yeah. Butterfly boy. Butterfly boy. Um, did you say so you absorbed his work? Kind of. Yeah, it was kind of like you, I, of all the people that I met, it was kind of like, whoa, that's kind of because I was really heavily influenced at the time by Howie Mandel with my body language and you know, like hey, 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 hey. But also this kind of I don't know. And Robert stuff. Nelson is very different from that, isn't he? From yeah, but in the, the cynical, the cynical kind of humor, like when I juggle the bowling ball i bring out a little kid and say okay come on out you know and uh so is this is this heavy is this and i would hold it over his head and say the bowling ball's really heavy isn't it isn't you know like threaten the kid with the bowling ball and then i would see robert doing this kind of stuff and i was like aha that's that's the kind of humor i like i like this kind of stuff this guy's funny and i met robert and we started talking and I remember sitting there one day with Robert and he's like, um, I made the comment like, oh, you know, I'm just doing this to pay for college. I'm not going to do this. I'm not a lifer. And he just kind of smirked and said, no, you'll never stop doing this. I can see it. You, you've got it. You've got it. And you'll never, you'll never leave us kind of thing and I was like yeah whatever you kooky bald hippie dude hanging out with all these other kooky hippie dudes it's like no this is just the stepping stone and this is something that Michael Davis had said in an interview it's like oh juggling's it was in the juggling magazine it's like juggling is my vehicle it's not my destination but if you google Michael Davis he still does juggling shows all these years later. And Michael Davis did shows for Ronald Reagan at the White House. He was on The Tonight Show and on Saturday Night Live and was a big influence in every s s comedy juggler in the United States has their mo – anybody that came after Michael Davis has been influenced by Michael Davis, whether they know it or not. And he was a San Francisco performer who – went big and uh, did Sugar Daddies on Broadway with Mickey Rooney. That was one of uh, Michael Davis's big. But just, so just, he, to folk, just to focus on you. And I did, sugar, I did Sugar Daddies. I did okay. Sugar Daddies in Indianapolis at the, at the dinner theater. Uh, six week run or I don't know, a month long run of when, when I was in high school. At but Union Brian, Station. I, I, I want to focus on you. With and that introduction now. came from Judy Hubbard, my my uh, choral director. She says, oh, my friend is the director at the Beef and Boards Dinner Theater where we take you kids every year for a cultural experience of theater. And uh, you need to go and be in Sugar Daddies. I've told him about you. It's kind of so I went and I got to work with a live band. I had a live band, you know, doing my da -dum -dum and the burlesque show thing. So it was awesome. It was like it was just handed to me. And I was everybody in, in Indiana knew me. And for years I'd go back, I'd be at the cash register at the shopping malls, like, you're the juggler dude. You're the juggler. People still remember 40 years later the juggler dude from Union Station. It's crazy. But, it's, but just to get back to where we were Robert Nelson, so you've seen Robert Nelson's show. You thought this is Yeah, fucking, and I became and it's that. not even like I, I became like friends with him. He's like you come to San Francisco, you you know, stay with me. He took me under his wing kind of. Um 
was really supportive. And he'd do workshops at the juggling convention, you know, how to do a good street show, comedy workshop. And I remember, like, I've still got my notes. I have a ledger of notes that I feverishly took when I was, you know, in like 86 or something, um, 85, 86 notes. Uh, and then on that, the San so my plan was to go to Key West and then to drive out to California, stop in Texas on the way and visit one of my old babysitters. Now that I was grown up, I was going to go look her up. And I did. And well, and on the way, I stopped in New Orleans a couple weeks before the Mardi Gras. And that's where I met Lee Ross. I went down to Jackson Square and I got there day. I was there and there was uh, Michael James doing this huge show, standing on top of the ladder, juggling, freaking amazing. Michael James was and then I met a few other people. I think maybe Joey Joey was there. Or, and they said, you have your permit? And they told me how to get my permit. So I go to the city and get my permit and come back. And I'm hanging out. And up walks Lee Ross. And they say, hey, Lee, this is Brian from Indiana. Are they, hey, come meet the new kid. Lee, come meet the new kid. And as Lee walks up, he says, hey, Brian from Indiana. I saw you at the San Jose Juggling Convention Street Performer Contest. You suck. <laughs> but welcome to town. You got spirit, kid. Welcome to the big time kind of thing. So then Lee Ross takes me under his wing. Where are you staying? I said, I'm staying in my van. He's like, ah, not in New Orleans. It's a bad idea. And I'm like, no, no, I got it set up. So I got this deck and I can sleep under the deck with all, you can look in the van and you can't see me. I'm hidden underneath the deck made out of milk crates and a piece of particle board and uh was like yeah yeah you can come stay with me so i go and stay with him who was staying with this m magician guy who turned out to be a heroin addict who lee was trying to help out and we all crash into this magician's house and and that's when lee said he started teaching me some very valuable lessons like stop doing backflips dude stop you're gonna hurt yourself takes too much energy you're gonna wear yourself out you got to figure out how to do as little as possible and i was like yeah and like like stand you know stand in one place and do just talk as much as possible like robert like gazo okay and then lee would show me a few you know he'd give me some advice and then he's like let's go across the street and work on those stairs you know, let's not, I don't want to wait in line all day for my one show. Let's go over there across the street to that fountain and work those stairs, the fountain. I'm like, all right. So we go across the stairs and we open those stair pitch, the stair, Lee opened the stair pitch in New Orleans. Nobody even had a clue as to how everybody was just like going, oh, I want to work there where Michael James is working. Look at that huge crowd he's got. I want to work there. I want to work there. But Lee's like, no, dude, look over there. That's that we should go work over there. And I'm like, okay, let's go work over there. So because of Lee's gracious guidance and generosity and kindness and knowledge, I gained a lot in just a few days hanging out with him. And then I'm like, okay, I'm off to California. I'm going to drive on west. See you guys later. Been real. Bye. And I got to Texas, and my mother had said, uh, one of your friends from that baseball movie called. I want you to call him. So I called my friend. I said, hey, Kent, fly down to Dallas, and we'll drive out to California together. And he said, oh, I'd love to, but I'm going to Australia in two weeks on a walkabout with some of my friends. There's five of us. We're going to go to Australia. And I thought, oh, I'll go too. Lee Ross is going down there for the, I just met this guy, Lee Ross. He's going to go down there for the Brisbane Expo. He'll be down there in a couple months. Yeah. I got all this money saved up from working on these movies. I got money saved up from, I got money. Yeah, I'll go. I can't go to university until 
this is like March. I can't go to university until the next summer session or fall. I got time. I got money. Let's go to Australia. And maybe I can get it. If I show up down there, maybe I can get a job at the expo. So I drive back to New Orleans. Is that Expo 88? Expo 88. So I drive back to New Orleans for Mardi Gras 88. I say, hey, Lee, I'm back in town, and I'm going to go to Australia. I'll be down there. I'll see you down there. He's like, okay, I'll be at Expo in Brisbane. Okay, cool. See you there. I call mom. He's like, hey, I'm coming home, and then I'm going to pack my bag and go to Australia. <laughs> They're like, what? I'm like, I'll tell you more when I get there. So I go, and I go back, repack my bag, get a backpack, figure out, okay, I'm going to go to Australia. I've got... $26 a day for six weeks and a return ticket home. So if it works out, I'll stay for six weeks. If it doesn't work out, I'll come home. And two hours out of the airport, we're going to where one of their friends is going to be where we store our stuff. And we're walking along Manly Corso, Manly Beach, and the pedestrian mall has got this sunken amphitheater, 360 degree, one of the nicest pitches I've ever seen in the world. And I said, I got to do a show. I say to my friends, I got to do a show. We've just left the airport and we're like, you know, after a 25 hour trip from Indiana to Sydney. And they're like, oh, I'm like, I got to do a show. This is crazy. Look at this spot. And I don't have a show yet, really, because I've never traveled with a backpack and done shows. I'm like, okay, I got to buy. So I, I buy a roll of toilet paper. I get, you know, some stuff. And I go and do show. And I look at my hat, and they're like three bills, and the rest change. And I'm like, oh, man. This is going to, ah, wow, that was, what is this? I had stiffed. And then I realized I had dollar coins. I was like, whoa, $86 hat within two hours of landing in Australia. And I'm like, I remember counting them, looking at my friend and saying, this trip's going to last a lot longer than six weeks. And I was there for three and a half months in Australia and New Zealand. And I remember doing shows in Christchurch, people hiding in the shadows. I'm like, what on earth is this guy doing? in the pedestrian mall and i did tried two shows and was like nah new zealand isn't ready they're not enough people here this is a joke new zealand isn't any good for street performing christchurch nah let's go hiking or kayaking so off we what went was, to queenstown go what was expo 88 like oh expo 88 was amazing so by the time I got to, I had gone, I had done Melbourne, Adelaide, and then Expo 88 starts up. So I make it to Expo 88 and it was cool. It was Derek Scott was there. Lee was there. Um, some other acts, but I didn't spend too much time there watching acts. I gave Lee my promo material. He took it to the lady in charge and she watched my video. I had made a video, a really nice promo video, hired a production guy and spent $1,200 making a video. And because you've got all this experience in film, I suppose you're better positioned well, than a lot of a little people. Bit. And I wanted to go to film school, so I needed a sample reel of something that I could produce. So I said, I'm going to kill two birds with one stone. I'm going to make a promotional video, promote my job you show. Your and tell you that, mate? Can you move your mic a tiny bit? Ah, other earphone. We can we can hear the echo of me from your earphone in there. Oh, maybe you talk too much. Maybe I talk too loud. There, how's that? I've got it. Yeah, it's much better. So they looked at your promo, Expo eighty eight, and yeah, they yeah. went. So Expo eighty eight looked at my promo and they said, "Oh, he's a bit aggressive for an international audience. We can hire anybody." Just because he's here doesn't mean we're going to hire him. So Lee came back to me with that message. And I was like, what the fuck is that bitch saying? Fuck her. Too aggressive, my ass. 
whatever. So I went across the street into the pedestrian mall, you know, half a kilometer away from the expo, just across the river and started cranking <clears throat> shows with my too aggressive for international. Well, fuck the international audiences. I'll work the locals. And I went and worked at mall for a few, I, I wasn't there a long time, but I don't know, 10 days, two weeks, staying at the expo house and coming home. And I ended up making more money a day than the guys working at the expo were. Because they were getting they were one or two shows. They were, yeah, they were, and they, were on, they weren't getting tips. They were ah, just they weren't hatting. Okay. They weren't hatting, as far as I can remember. Expo contract was not a hatting contract. And I, I remember making, I remember doing my first $250 hat in, in, uh, in Brisbane in 1988. And I did an hour and a half long show and had it twice. And the audience just kept getting bigger. They loved it. I don't know what. I have no idea why it was so good. I don't know. I just like turn into this different person. It's like, it's like I don't know. I don't know. I can't remember. It's like I get in this other like into a different zone or something. And it just it was amazing. And I also think it was timing because nobody was really street performing in Australia until the Brisbane Expo came. And the locals who wanted to go to the Expo, they wanted to go, but it cost a lot of money. So I'm sure that there were people in the mall watching my show going, whoa, this is freaking the coolest thing I've ever seen. They'd never seen it before. Whereas the people at the expo had never seen it before. But I think the people in the pedestrian mall appreciated it more because it was, I was on the fringe of the expo. And I was, you know, told by the expo, we don't want you, go home. You're too aggressive. And I thought, I'm not too aggressive, you know. I'm, that would be like saying the butterfly, they, they would have, so they didn't hire, that's why the butterfly man didn't go to Brisbane Expo. Too, it, it cause, and cause I can too understand their point. Too aggressive for an international audience. He, Robert was perfect for his audience where he was. And perfect in a, in a street venue. Maybe he's a skilled that entertainer. Character. Then yeah, surely yeah, yeah. So he's he, able to... If he was cast, but if they're looking at videos, you know, they can like she said, we can choose anybody we want. We can choose anybody. And the kind of act that you want at a festival is not necessarily the kind of act or the kind of character that makes money in the street. You tell me about it. They're, they're totally different things. It's like comparing TV and film production. It's like comparing radio DJ to a club DJ. They, they seem similar, but they're so different. So when people say, oh, you're a street performer. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 I do cruise ships. It's like, you're not a street performer. You're a cruise ship performer. Oh, I'm a, I, I'm a juggler. Oh, yeah, or do you street perform? No, 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 no. I'm not, so that's like Steve Regatz was a juggler who could street perform. And I'm a street performer. I became a street performer who can juggle as opposed to a juggler who can street perform. Who can go and street perform? You're not an athlete but if you're to trying to mold. You said, yeah, here's a you know you're going to go do an eight minute show to music in front of ten thousand people or in front of a TV camera. It won't work. I, I, it, that's not what I do, and that's not what I gravitated towards because in order to do that, you have to lock yourself away in a gym and be very diligent and practice a lot. Well, you're back to the, but, you back know, to the magician situation, work, aren't you? Instead of, instead of locking myself away in a gym and working 10 hours a day on Saturday and Sunday, I locked myself away in Union Station where I was making $10 an hour and I worked. And that, I'm like, oh. So so, so when does Japan come into I this thing? From, you're in Australia So now. on the way back, 
so I'm in Australia and I was there. I went there for six weeks. Ended up being three I months. met Rex Boyd. I, I met Rex Boyd down there. He was also one, you know, out pounding the pavement looking for- Is this for still when he's doing his juggling something. show? This is before yeah. he's written the, the so, you know, Robin Hood show. Here's the kid, the kid from Indiana and the kid from Kansas. And I think he had already been to England. He'd been around a little bit long. He was a little bit earlier than I was, like maybe a season or so. So we crossed paths a little bit and shared a pitch maybe in Adelaide or in Melbourne or something. And then, you know, see you later, see you later. On the way back, what I, when I was bopping around, my parents said, oh, this guy from Canada who you met in Key West, Dave, uh, Dave Peachy. Dave Peachy was a talent scout for the Busters Festival, the Halifax Festival. And Dave Peachy met me in Key West, took my promo stuff back, and they called and said, we want you to come not just to Halifax, but we want you to do a three city tour. You, Variety in Motion, this uh, husband and wife of man, uh, uh, duo act, man and woman duo act, Rick Schnitker and Mardine. Rick and Mardine did Variety in Motion, high energy juggling dance unicycle show, and they were doing it in Baltimore at the festival marketplace in Baltimore. And so there's going to be like six of us, the checkerboard guy. We're going to start Ottawa, go to Fredericton, do Ottawa Busters Festival, Fredericton Busker Festival, and then Halifax, 17 days, epic, you know, $10,000 first prize, 80 acts from around the world. But there are going to be like six of you who are going to do this Canadian, uh, the, the tour. And Brian, you're going to come, and we'd like you to come and be one of the, you know, acts. So I was like, cool. I get to be on, I'm like one of the guys on the tour. Well, I got to get back to America. So I call up, I'm like, mom, I'm coming home for two weeks. And then I'm going to Canada for six weeks or whatever. Here we go. Okay. Canada. Huh. So I fly back. I repack my stuff and then I go to Canada and I meet Dave Aiken, the checkerboard guy at the opening dinner thing, you know, and we're like chatting and we're there at the reception and he's like, yeah, yeah, I work this town, this is my town, I, got, I know where the pitch is, I was like, yeah, why don't we go check it out, One of our, maybe he suggested it, I don't know, I'm like, I don't want to just check it out, I want to go do a show and stand around here with all these, you know, is that, I wasn't old enough to drink alcohol by then yet. So you're at the opening party at a Buster's Festival. Oh, it's it's and, 21 there, yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, uh, Dave Vacan and I were like, hey, let's go to the pitch. I'm gonna go do a show. So I go and do my sh first show in Ottawa before the festival starts. We probably did a couple that night, I don't even remember. Um, and that's where Dave Aiken and I started bonding. Like he was showing me his stuff that he made, his custom bag for his ladder. And, and I'm showing him my road case with a sound system built into the lid at a road case with a sound system built in the lid. And, uh, and, um, so what was the show like? Oh, it was great. It was fun, you know, and I do the, just the generic North American juggling show. I had, uh, you know, just the, the Not generic. necessarily your show right now, but the show you went and did with Dave. You, you ditched out yeah, the yeah, party yeah. and that, went and did a show. show too. It, was, it was ditched the party and went and did a show, and, you know, it was fine. And what was the tour I, experience I like? The tour experience was, was wonderful. Dave and I drove together in his Mini from Ottawa to Fredericton. And he had a, a Mini, uh, Austin Mini convertible with checkerboards on the hood. 
And uh, he and I drove all the way from Ottawa to Fredericton, which is epic journey, six hours or eight hours or something. And then we did the, we get to Fredericton and Fredericton's a college town of about 50,000 people. And during the day, I'm listening, mate, you carry on. I'm listening. I can hear you. During the day, during the day in Fredericton, there's nobody out. There's just nothing. And, and the more seasoned performers started to think, oh, this isn't going to work. There's not going to be anybody here tonight. This, this, we made a mistake by coming here because the deal was airfare and room and board provided, transportation provided, everything provided, audience provided, meals, and prize money. So you got nothing to worry about. Except it was not going to be an audience. So Gazo and Birdie were like, wait a second. I think we've been had. We've been had by this producer, Dale, the producer of the bus, original Busker Fest in Halifax. They, the more experienced performers were like, man, we, this is not, a, this isn't in the best interest of performers. We need, we should go on strike and we should have held out. We should, we, we need a guarantee. I didn't leave my pitch in Boston to come up here and do shows for nobody. Nobody gonna be here. This is a joke. And I'm like, uh, if a kid from Indiana can come out of the cornfield and replace you, go on strike all you want but they're gonna come out of the woodwork dude you know there's somebody from kansas gonna do this you know they so and i think they're gonna be they dale says there's gonna be people they're gonna come he's like but there's nobody here this town's dead and i know what it's like in indiana Two hours before the fair starts, there's nobody. The fair starts, everybody shows up. And the fair ends, everybody goes home. So I was like, eh. But they're used so to being in tourist like, places, I suspect, for, for most of their time. Exactly. Forward. You know, yeah. they're from London. They're working in Boston. You walk out your door and anywhere you go, there's people. It's like, like taking, you know, like pigeons in the park. You just toss some crumbs out and they come everywhere. So... And Rick and Mardine were sick. They had Rick, one of them had food poisoning or something. So they were kind of under the weather. And I saw this as my chance to win. I'll get the prize. I'll go out and start doing shows before everybody else gets their costume on. And was this an audience vote kind of situation? Yes. Is it popular? But okay, so, so you're yeah. not going to have a few yeah. a few judges snoop you. Exactly. It's how much no, you no. literally entertain people. Yeah. And um, so, boom! I win the People's Choice Award for the Fredericton Buskers Festival, and I got that and award. Did everyone else work, like, or did, did you did you win it by proxy? Yeah, yeah. You... And after the people start, you know, after they see the parking lot showing up, they're going, "Oh, actually, yeah. Well, yeah, I better go get my costume on." And I was like, "Ah." Yeah, I saw that hand of, you know, that little hand. I So you, so you won the prize, and you sounded like you deserved it. Yeah, you were the most I positive, won the prize. Hard working. And Rick and Mardine got, they, Rick and Mardine should have won. They had the best show. They, you know, they, uh, they hands down were the, if they would have done a few more shows, then they would have won. It's just a matter of how many shows did you do and how many people did you appeal to. I ended up going out on a date with uh, hanging out with the Miss Fredericton chick who was, you know, like there, the beauty pageant chick. I had the town and palm on my hand, you know, because they I was kind of the same stock of people. It was this little farm town that just happened to have a college in it. You understand the dynamic of the place. I, yeah, they loved me. They thought I was, you know, one of them. Hey, the kid from Indiana. Um, 
you know, a checkerboard guy. He I'm had a good show too, but he didn't have the um, the foreign. He had the I'm the Canadian content of the show, you know. But he didn't, and then he didn't. He's really he's kind and gentle in his show and fun. And here I was a little bit more punchy and a little bit racy. So the Dave Aiken show works for everybody all the time. And my show sometimes rubs some people wrong or the kids don't get it. So my show works all the time for 80% of the people. And it might work, it's like a 10 for 80% of the people, whereas other people show that appeals to everybody, it might not be a 10 for every. So on the, on the, at the end of the day, it's, the average is the same, but the they target markets are a little bit different. Yeah. So, you know, it's like trying to say which is better, Chinese food or Italian food. It's like you and can't compare them. So are you different. hot shit? They, You've won, a, you've won the Halifax bus competition. Number one out of some of the best buses mm -hmm. in North America. You hot shit. Fredericton. The Fredericton. Ah, the Fredericton. Buskers. Ah, okay, yes. So by the time we get to Halifax, and I didn't win it because I was the best act there. I won it because I well, beat Halifax. everybody. I was there before the hook went in the water, and I gobbled all the bait off. And it, I, I, I did it. And the show itself, you know, it's cr it, it's crafted as a as a street, you know, the sh the show, the beginning, the middle, the end, the build, the, that's all just the mechanics of doing the show. That's in a kind in, in a way, it's like monkey work. You know, it, it's 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 tried and true. You know, it's been done before. It's just telling a story. So then you got to have the there's all these other elements. The show itself and the technical skill are like 20% of what you need to be successful. And and another thing is, is just the numbers, man. Over and over. People per square feet and emotional responses per minute. Those are the two big variables that I always think about. People per square feet and how many, I used to say laughs per minute. But it's not just laughs per minute. It's emotional. Yeah, well, you can make someone cry, okay. and that can be as successful as laughter if, yeah. you, if you've got that emotional content. I'm Don't loving everything cry. we're talking about. I just want to say, so we, have, we have four hours to interview, and after that, the program cuts us off. We can't go How anywhere. long have we been? Um, we're on two hours and 45 minutes at the moment. So we have an hour and 45, and I know Japan is going to be a really big part of your story. So there's two options uh, not either. Really. Not really. No? Well, I don't know. I suspect it wouldn't be. Um, so, well, we have two options at this point. We can, we can finish the interview me, now, me, and we can do one, most what, one, one second, brother. You're going to get a chance. Because you're second. asking me, how did I get to Japan? And I'll get to it. Definitely. I'll speed it up. But I, I just want to give an option now. So there's yeah. two options. Either we can do another interview later where we just deal with Japan, and we can just finish off your story up to Japan now, or we can do Japan now, and we'll do the full four hours and get it all through now. It's up well, to we you. can get up to. Let's let's continue to get to Japan. So we just all I got to do is get to Halifax. Talk about Halifax because epic things happen in Halifax. Yeah. And then we can that can be summed up in fifteen minutes. And yeah. then we got however long to talk about. We got Japan. as many hours in the English plan. Um, we have an hour and ten minutes left. All right, so ten minutes, and then we can talk about Japan for an hour. Cool. Um, that'll at least get us introduced to Japan, and then in the in the sequel, um, when we come back next week or next month or whenever we it will, it'll be next month. Now I think uh, we're fully booked up this month, which is a nice thing to have. And then we can start talking about some of the. I, I've decorated the back here with like significant things that you can ask about. Um, which one of them is coming up? The first one is coming up, I think. It's uh oh well one of them, a couple of them are over here, my uh, mom and dad and my sister. Aww. Yeah, very important. And that picture was taken in Key West or somewhere down in Florida by my brother-in-law, which is another crazy freaking story 
about my brother-in-law and my sister and me and entertainment and oh it's uncanny the connection oh and there you see the robert nelson butterfly shirt yes so um and so it's what's the guy we've got hiding behind the TV there? We've got a white poster with a little guy poking out. It kind of looks from this, this is like a blues boy. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's oh, a, you've, got a, you've got a suit in a case as well. That's Dave Rave. Dave Rave's suit that he wore when he won the Tempos and Performance Festival. And that's his trophy. And that's the autographed picture. And uh, over here, that's... So he won that trophy. He won, how do you do this? Dave Rave, this guy, wore that suit when he won this trophy and the Tempos and World Performance Festival in 19, in 92. And you can see Dave Rave up here in the corner of the 93 poster who is returning to Tempos on as the, this is really hard to like. Oh, it's so it's so camera. frustrating when you when you reversed because mirrors. Which which where am I supposed to move my finger? But yeah, yeah. that's Dave Ray there with his DM unicycle, and uh, so right now he's in my bathtub soaking. He's on leave from uh, cruise ships or not running now. So yeah. Dave A can hook Dave Rave up with a uh, cruise ship connection. And ever since Dave Rave has been sailing seven, well, like two seas. He hadn't been sailing seven seas, even though he has in the past because he was in the Navy. But that's another story. Um, so yeah, that's Dave Rave's suit, and there's a whole story about that. So Brian, and where did we get, we get sidetracked? Where did you meet you Dave Rave? You got sidetracked because you asked me about the suit. We did. Well, you, you kind of you me. slightly slightly inferred that I should, so I thought it'd be rude not to. No, I didn't say yet. I didn't. You can ask me later. I said, look at so the playback, you, and then you know exactly. It's true. What I said. It's true. So you're in yeah. Canada. You get to Halifax. Yeah. So then we get to Halifax after my, you know, big success in Fredericton, and get on the news the newspaper front page of the newspaper. And so do you big, feel like big dick of the pitch when you arrive then? Um, not really, because I know Robert's there, Waldo Woodhead is there, the Waldo Woodhead shows in Halifax, and I know Waldo from the very beginning, when I was a kid, I saw Waldo, first 10 minutes I walked in the gym, 1986 in San Jose at the IJA Street Performer Festival, uh, I, at the IJA Juggling Convention had a street performing contest. It was like the first time they ever had a formal contest in the park. And there were, I don't know, 19 acts or there was a bunch of acts and they gave everybody fake money, Rastelli bucks, Enrico Rastelli. So they made little Rastelli dollar bills and everybody that was registered at the convention or something gets 20 Rastelli bucks to take to the contest and give the person that you like, you know, it's a popular choice of a uh, popular and so public people count, uh, choice. Count the, count the tokens. Yeah, and then at the end you count your Rastelli bucks and whoever had the most Rastelli bucks wins. So I went into this contest in 1986, you know, coming from Indiana, Unis, uh, Union Station, I've gone from being just a juggling kid at the IJA to I'm gonna be in the street performing contest and Waldo Wood, the Waldo Woodhead show is in it. Well, they're going to win. I know I'm not going to win the contest. My goal was not to come in last. I don't want to come in last in the contest. That was my, my goal. So I always set realistic goals. And then you, you, you know, don't shoot for the stars because if you miss them, you die. So just kind of like, Make your goals realistic. Conservative, maybe. Which people who know me would be like, dude, you are not conservative. You're the most whacked out dude we know. People like have all these crazy stories about Brian stories. I'm like, don't but tell anybody. You do, 
but but you do live in one of the most luxurious places in Japan, one of the most more expensive countries to live. You you seem like someone who's been fairly planned. You've held your life together. But once again, we digress again. You're in yeah, Halifax. Yeah. So I get to Halifax, and I but I know I, I, you asked, did I feel like the big act in Halifax because I won yeah. in Fredericton? And I'm yes. like, no, I I maneuvered myself. I was in the right place at the right time, and I I acted a court. I acted in my best interest. I didn't take advantage of anybody. I didn't, you know, I didn't have any arguments with anybody, or you know, there wasn't any dissing of. You Did know, you have a good time? In Halifax, I had a great time. I loved it. I was on cloud nine. I was in my own little world, happy as could be. I wasn't, you know, like I was the best act in Fredericton. I was like, oh man, I look, check this out. I won, I got the interview. I got to take home the news, you know, the story. So now I've got this to take back to Indiana and say, you know, world traveled street performer who has been award winning, award -winning internationally traveled street performer who has Hollywood film production experience returns to indiana need somebody to do a show at your birthday party you know like who are they going to hire and it's like hey and so is that what you did because i was the only one doing it that was another yeah. thing is that what you did so I, you get went back to indiana? I get to halifax yeah. and you know it's great lee ross is there everybody's there master lee robert nelson um the Waldo Woodhead show, uh, Rick and Mardine, um, Peter Gross, magician, uh, so many acts. And I apologize for if there's people that I've missed, but um, myself, that's where I meet Twist and Shout, Dave Rave and Henrik. Dave Rave and Henrik Hardcore. <laughs> and they are Twist and Shout, and they're from. They work at Pier 39 and they work Fisherman's Wharf, San Francisco. They had worked all over Europe, uh, living, you know, traveling in a van and doing European so scene. And then they so came back to the United States. So they, these guys were hilarious. The Jerry Lewis kind of goofy character. Um, Dave Rave is the, you know, the goofball. Was it, and was it a riot the, passage? For them, for them coming over to Europe, was it like an American performance thing that you go to Europe to kind of earn your Actually, stars? no. Dave Rave learned, I think he became a performer in Europe. I think he, um, he cut his teeth in Europe and then I came say, back to the United States. I say so that that's I one to... great thing about, one of the things I really respect about our admire and respect about Dave Rave and can say he is a he's a he's one of the boys. He's a hardcore street performer. He didn't see somebody at Pier 39 and go, oh, I want to do that too. He was in Europe hanging out and was hanging out with some jugglers, like juggling, learned to juggle, and then it evolved into doing shows. He didn't start performing because he's like, oh, I'm going to become a street performer because I can make some money and buy some weed and go hang out for a week. He, he was generally interested in performing and he was very interested in that kind of stuff from when he was a kid too, I think, which you'll find out when you talk to him someday. But, uh, and then he met Henrik and they hit it off and they started traveling around Europe and doing the European street performing uh, life thing. And they came know. back and they worked here at 39. And then we all show up in Halifax. Me, Dave Rave, and the checkerboard. Uh, Dave Rake, Henry, Twist and Shout, the checkerboard guy, and Brian, the kid from Indiana, are all booked in the same pedestrian mall on Saturday morning for the uh, first, you know, the first block. And how and Halifax at that time was set up in time blocks. Like you got the the morning uh, the. 12 to 3 slot or something or the the morning slot and the night slot and you get sent to a pitch and maybe you have it to yourself or if it's a big area like this pedestrian mall that was three or four blocks long down by the waterfront 
they'd send three acts down there and you guys go down there, you know, and haggle it out. Just like it was kind of structured in a, I like the way it was structured in the sense that it was similar, similar to what a real life pitch dynamic was like. So we get there and of course there's no people there yet. It's 11 in the morning or something or whatever. It's about an hour before the first show would naturally take place. And we start talking and, you know, we're starting to bond and get to know each other. And Dave Aiken and I have already driven across the country together. So we're kind of jom joms. And so we're like, why don't we, let's juggle together. So we start juggling, doing four man passing stuff. And eventually enough people show up for one show. It's like, okay, who's going to do the first show? And the consensus was, why don't we do a team show? We'll do a team. Let's do a team show. And like, uh, I can do this bit. I can do my signature bit. The one original thing that I've come up with in my entire life. Um, a variation on knocking stuff out of people's mouth as uh, juggling clubs around somebody and knocking the carrot out of the person's mouth. How do you do that by yourself? So I do it with a, a chop. And instead of and going from a long object, medium-sized object, very short object, going to remove the short object from the volunteer's mouth. Of course, the short object is in the beautiful girl from the audience's lips. She's standing, you know, and first is the straw and the cigarette, and then the final one is the, the match. And we're going to do it in one, two, three, throw the club high, reach over, give her a kiss, take the match, keep juggling. Thank you, right? So uh, that's my bit. I'll do that. Um, Dave Aiken, you do your cigar box routine. And Henrik and Dave, you guys will do your Diablo thing. And then we'll all do the closing. With, uh, we'll do open with a passing routine, uh, with club passing routine, doing three or four different patterns to music. And then we'll close by doing fire. Two guys up on high unicycles, two guys down below, doing a box, 3-3-10. Three, three, Bada bing, bada boom. Brian does handsprings across the stage, backflip. Guys jump off the unicycles. Thank you. Give us your money. So, how's that sound? We'll do a show. Let's do a show together. Great. And I have a PA. I was one of the few people in Halifax that year that had sound equipment. And uh, thanks to Lee Ross. And so I kind of MC the show because that's a really what I was the only thing I was really good at was talking and organizing kind of like let's do a show together right you do this do, 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 do. how's that sound good all right let's go boom ladies and gentlemen team show and then it's a contest and each act has a number and in the program the audience members have a ballot they're going to watch shows for 17 days and then vote for the act that they like the best by writing the number of the act on the ballot, drop it in the ballot box scattered around town. All right. Well, um, and we got to come up with a name for our show. Um, we were the, the Bounty Brothers. In the United States and Canada, there's a product called Bounty Paper Towels. Bounty Paper Towels. The Quicker Picker Upper. And they would... The commercial, as we grow up, they maybe even still have it, they do a comparison between brand A and bounty paper towels. Who, which paper towel picks up the, soaks up the spilled milk faster? Bounty paper towel, the quicker picker upper. So we're jugglers. We're the quicker picker uppers because we're always dropping stuff and we can pick up our clubs faster than anybody else. So we're the bounty brothers. I think I came up with that name because that's how I am. I work really good under pressure and improv. So first show is a huge success. And we don't feel like we've done anything. We do this epic 45 minute long show, massive crowd, huge hat. And the crowd's like, when's the next one? We didn't see the beginning. And we all four look at each other. We look at the hats and we're like, next show in 10 minutes? And we're like, yeah. We did like six shows together that day. 
and we barely broke a sweat and we worked that pitch we worked that pitch and then the next day we're that night we go back and we we're like what are we going to do tomorrow guys we want to do this again tomorrow and there was a, a a pitch on the around the corner from that original pedestrian mall on the hill next to the sheridan hotel and a big grassy slope hill and at the bottom there's the it, it was like the worst for a solo act it was the worst pitch in halifax it was on the back side of the one of the buildings that bordered the Sheridan Hotel and the Festival Marketplace. So if you're on the other side of that building, that's where the waterfront is, and that's where all the people are. So this is kind of like on the back side of the best place to be at the waterfront. So it's great if you have two guys on a un on big unicycle going around and saying, hey, around the corner, there's a show already started. Seats available, come on over, see three shows. And the time it takes to watch one, save time, one crowd build, one hat pass, and three acts. Come on over. Enjoy the three best juggling acts at the festival. So then you have one, two guys herding people over, one guy packing people in. Oh, could you move over a little bit more? Directing the audience. And one guy on stage doing warm-up stuff. And between the three of us, we had three pitches that we could barter with other performers and say, hey, you're at the Sheridan today. Do you really want to do your cups and balls routine for two people? Or would you like to work this pitch? We'll trade you. We have these three pitches. Which one would you like? So we just took over the Sheridan pitch. And every day... We went and we worked the Sheridan pitch like no other act had. And nobody cared ever because no one else wanted to work it. And and they they didn't have the the they didn't click. We clicked as a unit like we all kind of we it was that show was so much fun. Why it was you click as a unit? We just our personality we we everything our skill levels complemented each other our characters complemented each other um we had you know the the nice canadian guy we had the canadian you know the checkerboard guy hey, and, well. yeah then we had the you know the henrik with his danish english accent and on um, the danish cowboy so you had the quirky european you had the goofball Jerry Lewis on acid Dave Rabe character. And then you had like the suave, cocky, American, sexy, backflip throwing, shucking and jiving, kiss stealing, you know. Movie cheeky, dude. cheeky little chappy. Yeah. And, you know, funny stand up comedian type guy, the clown, the European, and the. You know the Canadian, the nice Canadian who could juggle seven balls and, and so do did everything. Tour, did you guys tour past Halifax? No. Just no. It lived in its we, own space no, and time. And we were group. We added our numbers up and said we're group number ninety-two. Like us, if you want us to win the prize, then write ninety-two on the ballot. We got disqualified because. We we were like these bad boys, like we 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 shook up the the system. They the producer never expected that to happen, and he had took a, he sent us there expecting to get three acts to fill three slots, and then we became one act. So from his vantage point, we weren't following the rules of our Contract. engagement. We weren't showing up on our pitches. So the schedule said, you know, come see Brian Hulse and at pitch A at this time. And, you know, and he's like, if everybody did this, my whole system, you can't be, this is anarchy. We were like the example of what's going to happen if the performers decide to take over, if the performers get 
too much power, then I can't control it. So you guys are out of the content. You're not in the running for the ten thousand dollars. You want to do that? I'm not going to send you home. I'm not going to throw you out. I'm not going to tell you not to work, but you're not following the rules, so you don't qualify for the prize. Instead, we got instead of ten thousand dollars, we got uh, this. We got um. We got this. The Bounty Brothers. Brian's 1988 Lewis. Buskers 88 Bounty Brothers trophy. You, you got the horseshoe. We got the horseshoe for and uh, our prize was the most refreshing act. We were the most refreshing act and we got three thousand dollars to split between us or something. So they didn't completely uh, fuck you off. They must they have didn't appreciate what you did. But we weren't in the running for the we were specifically told you will not be in the running for the grand prize. But you know, you said that they had to do that. Which um, Waldo Wood had won that year. So it's this really oh, tight, tight. Um, it all kind of like is connected. In my life, all of these things that seem really random, and I've been rambling on for three hours. They're they're significant, especially since look at this. Look who else is on this poster. Look. It's the Waldo Woodhead show at Tempozon in Osaka in 1993. Competing against Dave Rave, who won the year before. And these guys got invited to Tempozon 93, which, oh my gosh, once we get to Japan. So there we are in Halifax, and we're all staying together, and blah, blah, blah. Robert Nelson's there. And um, I get a phone call. I call home. Hi, mom. How you doing? Yeah, doing this great stuff. Da da da. I think they even came up. My parents came to Halifax. And by this they point, they all the way up. Are they supporting it? They agree with it. They're like good. Oh, on they you. love it's it. Not. They drove all the way to Halifax, Canada, from my grandparents in New York. You it's know, like days drive. Yeah. Well, yeah, like epic journey to come and check out the street, the Buster Festival. It was awesome. And then they say, uh. David Cole called from Japan and he wants you to come. He wants you to call him. So I call him up. I'm like, Dave Cole. Oh, Andrew Cole's brother, who I met at Pier 39 after watching Robert Nelson's show on my way from, on my way from, I guess maybe it was on my way to Australia, or on my way back from Australia. I stop in San Francisco and I'm staying with Robert Nelson. It happened to be the weekend of the Street Performer Festival. And this Pier 39 Street Performer Festival is going on, so like the biggest time of the year. And David Cole, whose brother is one of the members of High Street Circus, who was another major act at Pier 39 at the time, David Cole had become an agent in Japan and he was looking for 12 acts to come to a traveling expo called the American Train in Japan. So Dave Cole and two Japanese men from Osaka go to San Francisco to scout acts. They're looking for 12 acts to come for three months apiece, uh, four months, uh, three performers for a three month contract four times in a row. So that's how I met Dave Cole, Robert Nelson's show ends, and it's like, oh, by the way, this is Brian. He's a juggler, too. He's from Indiana, and uh, he's staying with me for the weekend. I was like, hey, here's my business card. Here's my video. So months later in Halifax, Dave Cole says, Brian, we would like you to come to Japan for three months to be one of the acts on the American train in Japan. Andrew Potter and Wheeler Cole are here now. And they're going to go back. High Street Circus goes back, and you're going to come and replace them. Are you interested? And I was like, yeah, I guess. Uh, Mom, Dad, I'm going to go to Japan in September instead of going to university again. But I'll only be there for three months, so I'll start college and after Christmas again. Okay, yeah, no problem. Good luck in Japan. 
because my three month contract in Japan is going to pay for one year of college. So I hang the phone up and I turn to everybody and I'm like, hey, Dave Cole invited me to Japan. And Robert Nelson said, I'm never introducing you to anybody again. I wanted that gig. You stole my life. You stole my act. Now you steal my gigs. Kind of jokingly, jokingly. Because other, one of the reasons I got the job is because I was available on short notice and I was cheap. Everybody else, it turns out that High Street Circus got like five times what I was being paid because they were a duo act. And when they booked them, they, uh, you know, they, they didn't know what they were doing in the beginning. And then they're like, ah, you know, find something cheaper. So they found me. And I didn't know. I thought I got it because I had a good video. But 20 years later, I found that out. might have been something to do with it. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. Well, it definitely did have. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Robert, as much as he said, I wanted that gig. He probably would not have done it because he would have had to have left Pier 39 for three months for the same amount of money that he was the same amount or less money that he was already making. And he would have been doing 15 shows a week instead of five. And some people, so, some people as well, it's, it's more the fun of it. It's like, oh, you, oh, you got me kind of thing. You know, it's that oh, kind totally, of thing. Oh, totally, totally. Yeah. Yeah, he's like, I, Robert, I got the job because you, nobody, not, you know, none of you guys would have done it. At that time, it was, you know, if there's $1,000 a week, $250 a week per diem, but 15 shows, at, you know, like 15, three shows a day and travel on your day off. So you never have a day off and you do three shows a day and for three months. So it's hog and slog. Just, well, some people go at a hog slog, hard slog, but go rocks in the driveway or cut wood in the winter, throwing stuff and yelling at people and getting money for it. Have you do three 30 minute shows a day and your audience is there. You walk on and they're there. You walk out on stage, they applaud. You muck about for 25 minutes and say, thank you. They applaud. Everybody wants to take your picture and you go back to your dressing room. You sleep until your next 20 minute, 25 minute show. You stumble out to the stage. You muck about for 25 minutes. You ride a unicycle for you know, five minutes and juggle a tennis racket, a bowling ball, and a baseball bat. And you tell some jokes, make an animal balloon, thank you, and you go, you know, and you get $1,250 a week. Yeah, and, oh, you have to travel on your day off. Well, what, are, what do people normally do on their day off? They take a trip somewhere. So people, oh, it's so much work, I need to get paid more. It's like, shut up. Go shovel snow, go cut firewood, go go sweep rocks in the hot sun. It's a gift. It was the best gig ever. And I basically spent no money. All the money they paid me, I saved. Sent, I didn't even use the money. The, the pay all went into the bank. I didn't even see it. And the per diem, I... I ended up saving a bunch of it because I made friends with the people that had the food stalls and stuff at the event. And I ate for free. Um, you know, so I like had pizza every day. Let's yeah. say, Spine, I know, because awesome. I've talked to you about this, I know that you've got a lot to talk about in Japan. And I don't want to squeeze it into half an hour. So can we, okay. well, can, that's we how I got it, Japan. can we call it for now here? Now we're getting to the point where you're going to Japan. We call this into now. Guess. and do it. Do it again in three weeks' time. Is that okay? I guess. Or yeah. and then I came to Japan, and I've been here ever since, pretty much. That's There's it. There's a lot more. I I've talked to you about this. There's a lot more to that story. Bugger off. We're going to tell the story in a couple of weeks. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. I mean, people are interested. How many people are even not? How did we ever have any any people watching? Oh, we had we people watching through the entire start. We've had comments. Lee Ross has commented a few times. Lee Ross is watching. What do you say? We've got four likes. So just quickly, to read from Lee Ross. 
I'll be very Can I see concise. the comments? You should be able to see them, but you'll be able to see them after the um, after the video. You'll be able to see all the comments in there. So I tell, I'll leave Lee Ross's stuff for you to read after. Um, I just oh, say it's no. fine. It's, I don't it's, see how to see the comments on my computer. Oh, I'll show you after. Don't worry. You will be able to see them. Um, Is there anybody watching now? Yeah, people are watching now. You've got people liking, I mean, smiling, really? loving. We've got, I think, about two people watching right now. Two. But that's... Yeah, you see. But it's the middle of the night. It's quite late. I wouldn't worry about it. Most of the people watching the videos... I, and I didn't tell after. anybody. I didn't well, tell anybody. Well, there I'm you go. And as well, as well as that, bro, we get 500 people watching the videos after, but really? we only use... Yeah, we only usually get like five to ten people maximum watching videos live anyway, so I wouldn't worry about it too much. Um, aside from describing the channel there, everybody's been watching. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Brian, is there anything you want to yeah. say, everyone? And thank you for supporting this, everyone, because it's a great thing. That's how Matt and I met, because I thought, oh, this guy needs help. He needs support. He needs love. And uh, so I'm here giving you my thank love. You, brother. And your love and support is welcome, and your stories are welcome. Thank you, Brian. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Thank you for watching Wine On today. Thank you for your support. The show only works with your support, with your patronage, and your donations. Everybody, I will make a video soon to thank you all personally. For now, everyone, thank you. Goodbye. 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 Sayonara. Goodbye. Sayonara.